All right. Well, good morning. Um, I wanted to say, I wanted to start by saying thank you all for logging in today. Uh, my name is Emily Doreen. I work for Skagit County as their habitat restoration specialist. I've been here for 15 years and for the first 12, I kind of had to bumble my way around, you know, learning as I go, reaching out to the connections I made along the way. And so when the idea of this conference was born, I was really excited to finally have a North Sound specific opportunity to discuss techniques in our region, lessons learned, emerging science, and just be able to expand my riparian network within the region. Um, along with this conference, we have a riparian work group and that they we operate a listserv. So I'd encourage anybody interested to reach out to Brenda Clifton. Her email address is shown here. Um, you can also reach out to Andrea. She sent out the registration information for more information. But if you're interested in joining the listserv, it's a great way to share ideas and communicate with one another. As a heads up, this conference is being recorded. And this conference um, and the previous year conferences can all be found on the Skagit Watershed Council website. There will be a question and answer period after each speaker presents. All right, so I'm confident that we have a good lineup for you today. We have some great speakers and presentations. Along with that, you know, we're really excited to share information between and amongst practitioners, increase our general knowledge base, and maybe even learn some areas where we can continue, you know, focusing our efforts. Um, I look forward to and learning to learn to learning and engaging with you all today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Andrea to get us started. Uh, my goal is to help you develop uh, your role in, in regional knowledge creation. Uh, and this project involves a complex interagency effort. And my presentation doesn't reflect the opinions or policies of my employer, the National Marine Fishery Service. Uh, any snarkiness is mine alone. So we naturally focus on our jobs and institutions. Uh, I want to take a moment to consider the body of knowledge that we carry as a community of conservation practitioners. And I don't just mean you know, bureaucrats like me, uh, but also public and private, professional, amateur, settler, indigenous, you know, we're all carrying and developing a body of knowledge about how to tend and restore ecosystems. Economists call bodies of knowledge like this public goods. You know, if you dip into the well of knowledge, it doesn't diminish the knowledge available to me. In fact, it's the opposite. And that's what's called a non-rivalrous good and a non-excludable resource. It's a public trust resource. So knowledge is a public trust resource in my mind. So uh, I'm an improvement nut. I always look for weakness. And so I, can, I wanna start by uh, celebrating uh, how much we've done and how far we've come. But I think the stakes are really high in this ecosystem stewardship project. And I think that our work depends on each of us having as much knowledge as possible. And so I would even go so far as to propose that knowledge is actually sort of vital to the, the function of our civilization. That's an idealistic view of ecosystem knowledge. And in reality, our restoration system you know, has a few issues. Uh, on, on some days, the work of restoration can be less about restoration and more about playing a particular role within a social economic system. So while we work in programs, uh, when it comes to being personal carriers of community public trust knowledge, uh, we can actually operate at larger scales. You know, creating, storing, sharing, spreading public trust knowledge functions best across a network. Uh, and your individual behavior and my individual behavior determines if the network functions and networks function beyond the scope of particular institutions. So what I have today is kind of a question for us, which is to what extent do we have a clear role in a shared uh, knowledge system? Uh, you know, where does ecosystem knowledge come from? Where is it stored? How does it pass between generations? Uh, are we part of that? Is ecosystem knowledge widely accessible and distributed? Uh, is it tended and treasured? You know, these are the things that often uh, occupy my mind as I see all the different people doing all kinds of different work in different landscapes. And I suggest, suspect that some aspects of our ecosystem restoration system may interfere with these higher functions of knowledge networks. So for most of restoration, the money comes through a political legislative process, which makes decisions very quickly in, in, in what can be a very low trust environment. Uh, resources are allocated through unpredictable and competitive grants. Uh, a cluster of hierarchical institutions with their individual institutional behaviors and rules, they struggle to get enough resources or end up with too many resources. Uh, 
Uh, and the work of restoration is constantly wheedling to access private land with a whole set of attendant dynamics there. And then on the ground, the labor force uh, can vary from professional crews to underpaid short timers looking for a real job. And those crews are working in a very complex horticultural situation with diverse soils, hydrology, existing vegetation, doing lots of uncontrolled experiments. And we're all operating in a sort of wild self-organizing vegetation that is recovering from massive historical disturbance of settlement with some novel species thrown in and sort of blundering into a climate change future. So in that kind of context, that kind of systematic context, the opportunity for incoherent behavior is very high. Uh, simply because so many participants, so many different people are preoccupied by human dynamics that have nothing to do with developing a relationship to ecosystems. The restoration system is not necessarily designed for knowledge creation or stewardship. In fact, sometimes it's barely designed for restoration. So, so what factors are in our control? You know, how can we as individuals you know, respond to, to these kinds of circumstances? So I'd like to suggest that there are probably some valuable sociological analyses that may be really important to our work as rest in restoration. And they're not currently a robust part of our restoration conversation. And without diving too deep, I wanna focus our attention on the role of infrastructure, the little white bubble in the middle here, in supporting behavior. Uh, our industry, shaped by all of these incoherent forces, shapes our personal behavior through its infrastructures. It's always easier to go with the flow. If our knowledge infrastructure, if our knowledge infrastructure is weak, then participating in knowledge creation is difficult, and then we don't invest. We go with the flow, leave the knowledge in our heads or on our hard drives, and just kind of keep marching uh, you know, to the existing strategy. And for the past 14 years, I'd say, I've been working uh, on interagency coordination uh, to try to help state and federal agencies better support local restoration teams. And what I've learned through that painful process is how entrenched social infrastructure, how infrastructures uh, can undermine desired behavior. I suspect that uh, uh, some of that may also happen on the project side, but I'm less familiar. I just take this as a design context, right? Uh, this, what we can do is try and design our future. And uh, a design context for knowledge management, in this case, uh, requires some assessment. And in our industry, uh, many, many different people all have useful information and knowledge. Uh, learning is naturally distributed, distributed widely. It's iterative over and over again, and cumulative over a whole landscape of people and projects. And because of this, peer-to-peer -peer exchange has a really high value. But I suspect we still have very little knowledge infrastructure to work with. Uh, just conferences and professional publications. And each of those has significant limits uh, around who and how and we, how we participate and what we take away from them. Based on my interagency work, I'm also pretty clear that if we aspire to something better, then we're on our own. So shifting the culture and infrastructure around knowledge management will be a bottom-up effort that we must be willing to build new infrastructure and experiment with new behaviors. See, our, what I have observed is that our institutions are not incentivized or are not necessarily operating at the right scale to manage knowledge networks. And our current infrastructures are controlled by our institutions. And so many aspects of our institutional cultures uh, and the infrastructure that they've built limit information flow, discourage risk-taking, and encourage hoarding of resources. This is, I believe, our fundamental challenge. Uh, we must, as a community of practice, develop our knowledge about tending and restoring ecosystems as public goods and continuously improve that knowledge pool and bring lots of people into knowledge creation through inclusive networks that are strengthened by cross-institutional infrastructure. In our existing toolkit, we have lots of maps with dots, right? Here's the Salmon Recovery Portal and the NOAA Restoration Atlas and the PRISM Project Search. And these are redundant siloed systems developed using millions and millions of dollars 
Uh, there are similar systems that are less visible at Ecology, US Fish, NRCS, Conservation Commission. These are all reporting systems. They gather and summarize certain specific bits of information to serve an institutional purpose. Nothing wrong with that, it's just what they are. They're doorways to some kinds of information that they're not designed for learning. And they can't really be adapted because of how specialized their functions are. A Google search is another pathway with a different set of problems. Here you can find the wealth of the internet, 262,000 web pages associated with Salish Sea restoration, and the vast majority are all sites created by institutions to tell their own stories. But each time you walk into this forest of information, you get to try to synthesize what you find on your own. You have to hope that what you're looking for ranks high in the search results. If you want to contribute, you have to compete for site visibility. This is also a legitimate doorway into learning, but it doesn't offer a shared learning process. Encyclopedia of Puget Sound is being promoted by Puget Sound Institute and in University of Washington. It generates static articles disseminated and reviewed by experts on general topics at a high cost, and there's not a learning process. There's kind of a pattern here. I could go on and on, uh, but I wanna get to wikis. So in 1994, Ward Cunningham developed the WikiWiki Wiki web at his business, uh, which is Hawaiian Creole English for the fast web. And to support knowledge exchange among IT practitioners, he built a website with decentralized administration. Instead of a centralized administration, he relied on controlled privileges, transparency, and version control. That initial experiment resulted in the launch of Wikipedia in 2001. Now, 22 years later, it's the most read and referenced work in human history. So the Salish Sea Restoration Site uses the same underlying technology as Wikipedia. It's an open source piece of software. It, it was established in 2011 as a collaboration between DFW, Western Washington University, and NOAA in order to support increased knowledge sharing in the estuary and salmon restoration program that I helped found. At this point, the wiki, the current wiki in its current state gets around 1500 hits a month, mostly from natural searches, just someone sitting at home, typing in Salish Sea something or other, and they find the site. And this is only a handful of users populating and building out the site. So we are now currently moving the Salish Sea restoration wiki under the stewardship of the Society for Ecological Restoration as a prototype for bioregional information sharing. And we're working on expanding its use and utility around that partnership. There's a lot of new fancy things we can get wikis to do now. So why are wiki? I'm gonna start with just kind of to differentiate the wiki model in a quick sales pitch here. The structure and content of a wiki can be rapidly adapted and developed by the users without having to pay a developer to change the system by empowering users to directly develop the site, we remove institutions as arbiters of knowledge flow. This puts the power of web publication in the hands of a community of practice, but without each individual having to manage their own website. Wikis also create a permanent archive of ideas. The links are designed to be very stable. The entire wiki content is searchable so it's like a giant shared filing cabinet that never ends where nothing gets lost. It's extremely cheap. We can run the wiki for around $2,000 a year or even less under austerity conditions. And it is expandable and controllable. We're not subject to the whims of a private vendor who is selling a web product. And there's one catch to wikis. We actually have to govern ourselves, which makes it much more interesting. A wiki is simply a public facing website, standardized formatting. The content of each page is stored as simple text in a database. That text can include bits of code that let you do cool tricks, like make automatic lists of pages in a category. You can store all kinds of information about each page in the database, flagging different page types or categories or other information about the status or character of the page. And because the page content is just simple text, a little block of text, the wiki can afford to remember every single edit 
and every change by every contributor. This is the total transparency part. It's also very easy to insert hyperlinks to other locations within the wiki or on the internet, and thus a page can organize and curate other sources of information. So it's not just the information on the page, but the page itself can organize what's found out on the internet. And if well-structured, a wiki can be designed as a network of pages, like a well-organized encyclopedia with lots of internal links, and more about that later. In addition, the wiki can store and display various forms of media, including PDF documents and images. So with its continuous version control capabilities, it works as a highly functioning archive for documents and files. Finally, a wiki is designed to accomplish all of this with many, many, many users with assigned editing privileges. It's designed to evolve incrementally. It's designed to be very stable under very heavy usage. Wikipedia is currently evolving with over 133,000 active editors in 280 languages, the same software package. So a wiki functions as an autonomous learning environment where peers can shape and create knowledge exchange environments for the accumulation of evidence. It's really, it's a new kind of infrastructure. And for better or worse, it depends on the individuals exhibit what I would call pro-social behavior. Uh, the infrastructure makes sharing and contributing easier and it attributes every edit to a known user. But ultimately it still depends on a culture that is willing to share. That's why this is actually an offer. It's an offer from me to you. It's a simple question. Would you work with me to cultivate a knowledge sharing culture for ecosystem restoration? See, my contention is that our old infrastructure, our old knowledge management infrastructure is a bad steward of knowledge. Consider, for example, the accumulated knowledge of senior staff working in ecosystem management working for decades in places and projects and on topics. And that knowledge is thrown away through a knowledge disposal system called retirement. In another example, when the Puget Sound Action Team was disbanded and millions and millions of dollars of studies and reports paid for by the National Estuary Program and Pi Grants were discarded to clear the decks for the new Puget Sound Partnership website. These are normal knowledge management behaviors over existing systems, and there are lots of examples. So by contrast, the Salish Sea Restoration Wiki offers to be a sense-making tool. It forces us out of our institutions to create knowledge together about restoration. It's not an inventory of everything or a summary as a report, but it, it's a set of collections, a collections of ideas and evidence. There is an overarching structure, for those collections, ideas, and evidence. Uh, and uh, that structure can be adapted by the users, by the creators of that knowledge. So here's my entry for the Quilute restoration of the Snohomish estuary. It includes bits and pieces of information and evidence that are not available anywhere else. It reflects personal firsthand knowledge of the project. If someone else has better information, they can immediately edit and I will be notified that a change has been made and who made the change. The advantages here for me are substantial. If anyone asks me what I know about Quilute, I don't have to dig around in my hard drive. I just send them a link. I've already shared what I know of the public trust aspects of the Quilute restoration. So sharing again is easy and efficient for me. Uh, two colleagues can brainstorm resources for a third colleague. A link for the Quilute page is found on the Snohomish Delta page which includes a chronology of actions in the Delta. Chronology is a particularly important kind of storytelling that's easily forgotten and lost over the turnover of staff. This summary about what has happened in the Snohomish estuary after tens of millions of dollars of investment is not found anywhere else on the internet. That's because it is the result of interpersonal, experiential and intellectual capital in a way that is beyond the scope of any one institution. There's no other web page or social infrastructure on the internet or in any of our institutions that can curate resources like this. The home of the wiki page presents a knowledge architecture strategy. 
how we can put information into discrete packets that can be stored in the wiki database and linked to each other, compartmentalizing knowledge in a way that's useful. The wiki is a restoration practitioner time capsule. You get to decide what goes into the time capsule. To store information about pieces of ecosystems on the right hand side, we divide the landscape into geomorphic units following regional spatial assessments. Each geomorphic unit is shaped by similar processes, is degraded in similar ways, it's lived in in similar ways, and it's restored in similar ways. Floodplains all have something in common with other floodplains. In our mess of a human system on the left hand side, we store information about work groups, groups of people that work on efforts, time bounded and space bounded efforts that produce documents. Uh, some of which become resources. In the Venn diagram overlap in the middle are two very important page types about how human systems interact with ecosystems. Topics are what where we generalize on subjects and places are specific landscapes of human interest, which can be smaller than a geographic or geomorphic unit or combine a set of units into a whole watershed or a basin. So for example, the lower Skykomish floodplain is a place, not we control is a topic. The Cherry Point drift cell is a place, caring population is a topic. Uh, the, the Snohomish basin is a place and urbanization is a topic. So by having a shared framework, we can put together capsules of knowledge, give them flags and markers so that the wiki engine can find them and link them together into a living social ecological map of our bioregion, how we think about restoration, what we know, what we've done, where we're working. All of this depends on the work of wiki gardeners. That's people like you and me. And we don't each have to do everything perfectly. We each just pitch in our piece of history, our piece of the soup when we can. The wiki infrastructure helps us build the coherent whole over time. Edit privileges are contingent on supporting a social contract which is adjudicated by a coordination circle, which is hosted by the Society for Ecological Restoration through a stable operating agreement among active funders. The core operations of the site can be sustained with very few resources. My estimate is an $80,000 endowment could sustain site operations into the foreseeable future. It's the most cost-effective opportunity. So how could this help with riparian practice? because you, the user, can shape the system. The possibilities are really endless, but I'm gonna speculate based on how I currently use it and how I designed it to be used. Here is an old effort page for Fisher Slough. It's an important restoration site because of its experiments with self-regulating tide gates in the Skagit Delta. You can store information about as-builts and treatments and monitoring results in a way that supports follow-up work by colleagues in the future. Uh, place pages are for describing what we know and we've done in places of human interest. And places can be large or small. So this place page is about Grass Lakes Nature Preserve near my house. The city has been neglecting its community-based master planning and, and they, there's a lot of restoration opportunities there. And this, this lets us tell stories at a human scale about what's actually happened and what's in the landscape and what we know and build a shared knowledge of real places and their ecological nuances. Because every single place in the Puget Sound has a long history and idiosyncrasies. These place-based understanding and dynamics are very important, I believe. And they're rarely documented. We tend to generalize and not really nail down the details of place and remember them. And place-based understanding can inform both protection and restoration. Finally, the most comfortable place for the academics among us are topics where we gather information about recurring phenomena from restoration practices to federal laws. And this information sharing platform can be used to train staff, gather resources, curate evidence, do syntheses. I'm just currently finishing up a project to gather evidence about the effectiveness of beach nourishment as a mitigation measure and then publishing both the, the, the resulting report, which will be published by DFW, as well as all of the resources they gathered to the wiki. So it's a time capsule of what we know about beach nourishment in 2023. 
We can use the platform to complete literature reviews, conduct distributed experiments, which we'll learn about in a moment. I personally use the wiki across all my efforts and places, both as NOAA staff, as a private citizen. It's intrinsic to how I manage information that's part of the public trust. And it empowers me to be more effective and more efficient. And I would like you to be able to take advantage of this tool and to have it strengthen your work uh, while increasing the flow of knowledge within our community. So that's, my, that's my proposition. Um, I will be hosting regular wiki workshops and uh, next one is in February, uh, February 24th. Just go to the wiki. I can't tell you how many times I say it's on the wiki, just go to the wiki. Uh, and you can see uh, sign up information there in the top right hand corner. Uh, the workshops are informal. There's an opportunity for a guided tour of how the wiki is organized as well as to explore specific questions as a new editor. And I hope we have a little bit of time for questions. Yeah, Paul, we have, um, we have a couple of questions. One is, Paul, wow, what an amazing and accessible tool. What grant funding can someone utilize to fund staff time to create and manage a wiki? Oh, this is the fun part, right, is, is how do you uh, integrate? And let me know, I'm going to turn my video back on. And it, let me know if my audio starts cracking up. Uh, so all of your grant funding includes administrative costs. Uh, all of your grant funding includes reporting, information sharing. Some of your grant funding, particularly federal grants compared to state grants, may allow for sharing information at conferences, travel, blah, 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 right? So all of these funding sources already exist for us to be sharing information. Uh, this is just another tool rather than your hard drive. So my problem was, is I have so much information passing across my desk, I have a hard time keeping track of it. And so when I get new information, I just stuff it on the wiki and then I know I can always find it again. I don't have to dig around in my hard drive, right? So it's not necessarily about uh, a new thing. It's about changing an old thing so it functions better. So uh, a conference could, uh, as part of the conference, have workshops where people gather information and do a synthesis that becomes a wiki page. You know, there's a million ways to integrate wiki thinking into how we already do work. And that's the challenge. It's a cultural, I think it's a cultural challenge personally. It's less of sort of a, a technical or a financial challenge. It's really about a, a, a playing with culture in a way that increases sharing uh, and, and, and risk taking essentially. Okay, and then the next one, this is um, from the same person. Uh, the sharing of information, which is place-based, often resides in families. This could be true of tribal members, multi-generational land managers, or something. Yeah. yeah, and that's where I, what I'm what I'm interested in is uh, the deprofessionalization of stewardship. Right? We say we want it. We say we want to be part of a society that's capable of stewardship. But what that means is there's a lot more people involved in the processes of stewardship. And fundamental to that is place-based knowledge and understanding. We talk about citizen science. So there's all these things that we uh, toy with. I'm interested in exploring that territory more. I think we can do a lot more restoration, a lot more stewardship, a lot more efficiently over generations if we broaden the community that's involved in managing our knowledge of place. There are some privacy issues there that are worth exploring too. And that's, that, that's a tension. There's, there's gonna be tensions on all these areas and that's the challenge. But I think it's worth it to explore those tensions. Um, uh, and uh, Ashley, Arthur, are you just going down the list? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is this currently live, ready for use? Yes. <laughs> Uh, you can sign up now uh, to be a wiki, uh, but there's no, there is no privacy. There is no uh, secret account. Uh, I, I and others can verify editor accounts, and we need to know who you are, and then that goes on to the page. So you're, a, you're an actual, real human uh, when you sign up to be a wiki editor. Kelsey says you are missing a couple of tribes that are working very hard in the restoration efforts in the Salish Sea region? See, this is the interesting thing, because this question, 
there is a subtext here, right? About who's responsible for what. And I would like to have every tribe, you know, be represented as a work group, you know, in a wiki page and flagged as a sovereign tribal nation and to be able to represent their work. The idea that I can do that personally, you know, if I'm personally responsible, Paul Chiragino has to make sure that everything in the wiki is all accurate and up to date all the time, it doesn't work. So that's one of the presumptions about knowledge management that prevents knowledge sharing. So two, two strategies. I, I have actually put a lot of work into trying to include more and more uh, you know, tribes as uh, work groups and trying to represent some of their work, but I can't represent all the work happening in Puget Sound. Uh, and so then I would encourage others to help me out. Uh, without that help, it's a collection. It's not an inventory of everything. It's collections. And these happen to be the collections that I've had the time to start building. And by and large, I see the vast majority of the uh, content in the wiki is currently two, from two sources. Uh, one, is, uh, one is from Paul. I've been using this as my personal filing cabinet for 11 years. So this is most of this is the stuff that's flowed across Paul's desk that I believe is, is meritus of public trust storage. Uh, the other is ESRP contracts. When ESRP issues a learning contract, one of the requirements is that the contractee uh, provide uh, uh, information into the wiki about what they've done and their final reports and stuff. And that's unusual. Most people don't require that kind of public disclosure of effort. So beyond that, I'd say, this is, the, this, is, this is my debutante party. I haven't actually promoted the wiki as a thing, in part because we've been doing a process of transferring the wiki over to Society for Ecological Restoration for long-term stewardship, and then I can start driving resources towards SER and build it out as a prototype. You know, up until then, the, the, the management of the site has been kind of all over the place trying to figure out where to put it. So that's an interesting, that's, a, that's another beer-worthy story to talk about where to house such a thing. And then um, there's a question in the chat uh, asking if you talk to retiring personnel to get information for the wiki. That would be a big job. Yeah, no, but that's the thing is, is that uh, we're always waiting for someone else to do it, right? That's, there's a, there's a, there's a subtext to some of our thinking and questions and it happens to me too. It's like, well, someone should be responsible for this, right? Someone should be doing this. But because of the way our social infrastructure is set up, the way our institutions are set up, and the way our institutions interact with each other, this is one of those places where it's like everyone is responsible, therefore no one does it, right? If we're going to take control of our knowledge base as a community of practice, as members of the Society for Ecological Restoration or whatever, it's going to be through that that we start trying to capture this knowledge loss. And then maybe the institutions will catch up. And I think there's lots of ways to play that out. And I would love to have colleagues in that. You can become an editor. Some pages are protected uh, because they form sort of core architecture. Uh, please show up at uh, one of the workshops and I can sort of show you around and sort of the levels of editing. Uh, yeah, and how that works. But you can, just to edit a typical page, like an effort page or a place page, you can sign up now and, uh, and we can set you up and uh, you can use the wiki. You can try it out, see what it's like. Also, there's gonna be a lot of upgrades. We're still working off of an older technology and part of this transfer to SER is an upgrade in the technologies and will be much more 2023 you know, than we are now in terms of uh, WYSIWYG editors, what you see is what you get editing. Uh, increased data storage capabilities, and increased ability to, to show linkages between pages and visualize all that. Really exciting. I'm really excited. I'd love to have a team help me think about some of those issues. As a final pitch too, um, uh, we're about to see a, a conversation about distributed experiments, right? about uh, how different restoration practitioners could be running parallel experiments and increasing each other's ability uh, uh, oh yeah, I'll answer that. 
uh, increasing each other's ability to come to robust understanding about the effects of factors on your plant and that kind of stuff. And, uh, and I would love to explore that. Uh, I would think about how the wiki could be used as a shared workplace, you know, basically a free accessible public shared workplace for sharing information and data about experiments. So that's also a possibility. Uh, in terms of how to become an editor, there is a, uh, basically you push a button and create an account on the site. That when you trigger an account, that sends a, a note to me. Uh, and then in, it also sends an email to you saying, please contact this email and say who you are. And then uh, I take that information and finish creating your editor account and put the information about who you are on your own wiki page. So that, and that's, and then there's a, uh, and I also point you at the social contract, which is the agreement by which we become editors it's about how we manage uh, writing and conflict and information management, respect privacy and copyright and stuff like that. Um, how do you plan to reach people who you want to contribute information such as retired workers? Uh, so this is, and this is definitely a side gig for me. Uh, Noah and my management graciously allow me to do a few weird things, and this is one of them. Uh, I am interested in uh, playing around with that. I think uh, graduate students are actually a huge asset. And so I've thought about the, the idea of pairing or matching, creating a matching system of people who are retiring and people who are coming into the industry and having a knowledge exchange there might be kind of cool. Um, there, you know, I, I also like, uh, I think having kind of, uh, a workshoppy kind of things where we pick a topic and have kind of a wiki work party where we grab pizza and a bunch of computers and go hang out somewhere and try and fill out an area of knowledge would be kind of fun. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm interested in community processes. Uh, again, uh, I think that the, the, the toolkit, the cultural toolkit that we need to solve the knowledge management problem may not look like our normal institutional behaviors, right? And that's, that's the interesting territory in my mind. That is it that we're responsible for knowledge in a way that may be different than our obligations as an employee. And that's, that's, that's the territory that we need to explore is our personal responsibility for knowledge of place. Oh, NOAA has an archive of reports uh, and Ecology has an archive of reports. DFW is starting to build their kind of archive quality. Other institutions have greater or lesser abilities to archive. Uh, when someone has a stable archive, I often just create a link to that uh, the per, again, it's just the idea of inventory versus collection, right? I don't want to, I don't manage every report that Noah ever makes, but if Noah puts out a report that I think is really valuable or interesting, then I personally, Paul, will put a link to it on the wiki and provide a little bit of information about why I think it's interesting and important. And then it can be found as in the wiki collection. So it's a, it's a think of it more like time capsules and museum curation than uh, inventory. I'm going to leave the inventory work to the agencies, you know, and, and not try and get involved in that. Uh, and there's all kinds of rules about how and why agencies publish. They're constrained. There's legal implications. Again, it's like, this is why institutions are bad curators of knowledge, because they're very concerned for good reason about their opinions and their statements and when they make them. You know, so that's where there's, I think, a, 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 the, the, the creative work of trying to make sense of all our knowledge is different than the legal obligations for a public entity to publish. And we need to be able to separate those two if we're going to be able to do both things well. Well, thank you very much, Paul. That was great. And uh, I hope that it creates more traffic on the wiki site. <laughs> yep, it's, it's just there, it's just waiting. You, our very own endless museum, as many halls and corridors as we want. Uh, and so it would be fun to, to, to start decorating with some, some fans. Yeah, that's great. Um, now Adam's going to introduce our next speaker. 
Yeah, I'll echo Andrea and say thank you, Paul. Um, I think it's inspiring to think of all the knowledge that's held in the heads of all the practitioners and in the files of institutions. That is that co that common good that you referred to that can inform strategies for success and help with the positive restoration outcomes. Next up, Bob Vadas is next is uh, going to talk on this topic and build on that about how we actually gain that knowledge, how the monitoring data drives the adaptive management cycle and what we can gain from systematic approaches to monitoring. Bob is a research scientist with WDFW Habitat, working on biophysical issues for riparian and wetland, in-stream flows, dams, fish passage, overwater structures, marine hydrokinetics, um, and other topics for Western and Eastern Washington. Bob has over three decades of field experience on the habitat and eco-hydrologic needs of freshwater and estuarine fishes. Over half of it for over half of it for Western North America. This includes sampling and modeling fish habitat across spatial scales, and also research at altrophic levels. His long-term Olympic Peninsula work addresses lentic and lotic habitat restoration efforts with exotic plant removal and other potential hydrologic and, and water quality benefits for imperiled trout populations. The title of his talk is Development of an Effectiveness Monitoring for West Side Revegetation as Distributed Experiments. Thank you, Bob. All right, I'll get started. Um, so this, uh, this idea of de trying to develop an effectiveness monitoring program <clears throat> for uh, West Side Revegetation uh, hasn't to this date been done in a systematic experimental uh, way and and so the idea it, that we've come up with um, and with a lot of help from uh, Paul from <clears throat> who just gave a nice talk from Noah and uh, anyway uh, the and I've got some uh, my agency colleagues who've uh, provided some help for this talk in one way or another so anyway the uh, so the idea then is is to uh, figure out <clears throat> how uh, how, how do we do this? So um, we've given a draft proposal to uh, NOAA um, on this this issue. And uh, the big thing about uh, doing uh, revegetation um, is it, that's not all you have to do. You have to also do weed control and uh, before you can do the planting. And uh, this is very critical, especially now with climate change, where just to stay in the same place, we have to do more um, with uh, better vegetation, better shading that can help with uh, <clears throat> cooling streams. And uh, the uh, that photo there, all the photos I show are for the Northern Whatcom County where I used to work. And so uh, that's just a picture of my son many years ago obviously surrounded by a lot of reed canary grass. In terms of what's needed for management, um, I already mentioned the shade over water is very important. And we'd like this to be an adaptive management kind of uh, learning experience. And uh, this has become really critical in the last uh, <clears throat> couple of years with the heat domes and uh, deaths of conifers and uh, other species too. But uh, the, the idea, <clears throat> is is we if we want to save these uh, uh, save our forest and particularly riparian uh, forests we have to start thinking about uh, how do we do a better job at it <clears throat> anyway to, to date uh, revegetation is often done uh, with staff that are uh, not always well trained and they're often just getting started and uh, so. How do we do a better job of, uh, <clears throat> you know, of training and transfer of knowledge? And uh, so the idea is we know that there's at a large scale that there's a lot of vegetation and soil damage. And uh, <clears throat> so how do we how do we go about getting a lot of bang for the buck for funds so that we have a large spatial in, uh, impact and uh, and actually make a, a real difference for you know for a landscape I mean, we expect that this program which as i said is headed up by noaa 
to uh, kind of be an incremental opt-in as people um, <clears throat> can help with funding or for the practitioners who are doing the actual planting. Um, and as part of this effort, um, it, it should involve uh, interviewing the practitioners who know what's going on and how they're how they do their work and uh, and uh, basically uh, the learning should be two way. Uh, there's things that the agencies can bring to the practitioners and, uh, and certainly the practitioners uh, can teach us as well of what you know. <clears throat> What are their logistical constraints and so on? Anyway, um, the idea is um, if I'm <clears throat> if I'm involved with this, which I'm hoping to be, uh, would be to dis discuss with our uh, biostatistician to help develop uh, a statistical approach to do this. And uh, um, in the past. Uh, um, listserv chat for this group uh we got into discussions for example about the randomized block design which is which is a good one for what you can do spatial blocking and the treatment type would be you know what kind of planting uh method you're using so the idea is to uh <clears throat> come up with a simple design we've already met i've already mentioned the randomized block design um, and there's things like the line transect method, et cetera. There's all kinds of uh, subsampling techniques that can be used to examine plant survival and how well uh, tr given treatments working. Uh, you can also look at multiple environmental factors, all which can affect planting success. And uh, anyway, uh, <clears throat> to officially uh, capture the covariates, um, and uh, can, can include site and interannual annual conditions that may change, um, you know, spatially or temporally, and also to uh, <clears throat> make sure to accumulate data across the sites and and uh, really gain that knowledge. So anyway, each treatment type would 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 need replication and preferably on both stream banks, especially when you consider things like channel avulsions that can occur that might affect a planting and and uh, and there's other types of stochastic events that could uh, cause a loss of a treatment block, such as uh, lightning strikes. Um, you know, we had one site up in Bertrand Creek where I worked um, in Northern Whatcom County, where uh, it was obvious that uh, three wheelers had uh, totally uh, trashed a uh, planting site, you know, so it things happen. So, and if you only have one treatment type and it's gone, you've lost that treatment type in the experiment. So it's good to have at least two replicates. The uh, the idea is, is to uh, come up with protocols that are robust and, uh, retrospective and uh, we want to focus you know in terms of what is needed for planting is the site zonation preparation and aftercare uh, pre preparation of course includes uh, exotic plant removal which is often necessary to improve planting success and uh, the big thing of course with past planting sites is because there wasn't a standardized design, it's really hard to evaluate how successful things were and to actually learn and say, hey, this technique works better than that one. And these are the kind of questions we wanna be able to answer. Um, in terms of the plant species stock type and their counts, that's also important for these kinds of experiments. And as I said, the focus is, is expected to be in plant survival as is how effective a given treatment is. The idea as agencies is to try to provide um, field technical assistance, assistance to uh, <clears throat> and get a test run going and uh, to try to get this, this uh, experimental program going. And of course, a, a thing to focus on would be vol control. Um, as people know that that's very, um, they're very uh, significant grazer and uh, and I've been told that various 
growth forms of plants are going to be gold. So anyway, <clears throat> the idea would be to pr produce uh, some uh, cheap videos to help people learn how to uh, protocols for these experiments. It's better, there's a definitely some sound. There's some sound coming from somebody. I don't know. It's just uh, it's. I don't know if somebody's got their microphone on by mistake. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so ultimately the goal is getting better plant survival, and uh, and so these these uh, short videos could help uh, do that in by showing what's going on in the field and and all that. In particular, one thing that I've focused on since I've been at DFW is and, and even before it was uh, is. <clears throat> the the different channel benches which tend to uh, um, <clears throat> be dominated by different uh, floral growth forms and uh, as you get up higher farther from the stream you tend to you know go from the herbaceous to the shrubby to the tree vegetation and and with trees even some are more flood tolerant and are able to be closer to the stream than others conifers tend to be a little farther back um, and not right on the stream bank, but uh, in any case, um, these benches, it's good to understand these benches because where, you, you know, especially if uh, untrained people are doing the plantings, if you put them in the wrong spot, like, a, for example, if you put a dry adapted species on the, too close to the stream, it probably isn't going to survive. This just shows a little more about um, how the uh, the different benches work. It's not drawn to scale, obviously. It's a, but it's uh, you know, in general, the streams around here tend to be rocky bedded, and uh, once you get um, <clears throat> into the more uh, muddy kind of uh, fine soil. Um, as you move up the bank, you know, you, you have the low bench, which is the first one, and uh, the middle bench, which is the, the or the medium, is the woody one, uh, shrubs, and then the high bench is where you start getting into riparian trees, and once you get to the, <clears throat> and I show bankful width way up high there, and, uh, and once you get beyond that, that's, the, of course, the floodplain, and so the, the whole idea, we, we've, we in 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 uh, some of the agencies, uh, well, particularly DFW and uh, ecology, have have been interested in these things for fisheries reasons, but <clears throat> but they're also very important for uh, um, planting uh, as well. So anyway, that's that. Um, <clears throat> so the idea, if I'm involved in this effort, would be to provide. Uh, you know, periodic anal analytical support to do all, you know, statistics and uh, QAQC and <clears throat> and help uh, help uh, make see if these ex how these experiments are working as kind of a kind of a uh, quasi biostatistician role. But uh, the uh, <clears throat> in terms of future technical assistance. Um, Thinking beyond just vole control, there's other things, as we know, beavers uh, can uh, d damage plantings as well. But we also want to keep in mind that we can't, we shouldn't hate beavers because obviously they provide a lot of stream benefits as well um, to the riparian um, vegetation, to the wildlife, to the fish, fishes. And, and so we have to figure out how to uh, uh, deal with um you know that kind of a duality, and uh, but we do know that uh, um, they will, they could easily take out our plantings. So we have to figure out how to deal with that. Um, in terms of um, <clears throat> Paul, certainly uh, mentioned a lot about the Salish Sea uh, Restoration Wiki, and uh, and this this stuff we're talking about is. Sounds like it's particularly relevant to their to the floodplain module, and uh, <clears throat> and it's expected that this would be greatly used to make sure that knowledge is properly transferred 
for this for these that these experiments could generate and uh <clears throat> just a couple of reference citations that have to deal with these uh geomorphic uh morphologic benches that i was talking about and uh and uh and uh, my own Ohio work was talked about the three different benches, and each bench is associated with a toe width. Um, and toe is when we say toe, it just means where do you, you know what can you kick into along the stream bank, and uh, and those help can help define um, the uh, toe, or sorry, they can help define the benches, and uh, they also can help us with other things like um you know if we can if it helps us better standardize uh uh measuring bankful width it's good for fish passes issues it's also good for trying to estimate as a shortcut method um flows needed for fishes but for the purposes of what we're talking about today um as i mentioned earlier it's it's more related to uh <clears throat> improving planting success by standardizing where plants are done so that you get the maximum bang for the buck so there's uh one question in the chat from brenda she's one wondering if you can discuss a little more about how you might use transects to monitor a site um <clears throat> that's um i was watching a few a few of these type videos last night i mean there's you know the you know you're you're probably when you do this kind of work you know looking at plant survival you're probably you're probably wanting to subsample and uh and and uh and the the idea of having uh you know if you're doing it at a spacing and so you're getting a subsample you could you know you can do it along the stream but you could also do it up and down, depending on how uh, wide the uh, um, the planting is. But you you could have a perpendicular transect that <clears throat> you could have spacings as well, so that you're sampling in both the longitudinal and the lateral dir direction along the streams. It's uh, I mean that's just a, a general sense. I'm not a plant e uh, ecologist per se, but uh, but the idea could be you want <clears throat> depending again you want to make sure that you know it would it wouldn't make total sense just to sample in 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 one direction just if your plantings are also <clears throat> you know if it's a wide strip you want to catch some of that variation too so that might be one way um if and it, uh, if Brenda has some other ideas, I would be glad to discuss that with her later, you know, as this project develops. Yeah. Um, there's one question from Benjamin. Do you think there could be an NGO that takes on monitoring of projects for those who can't do it themselves? Unfortunately, you know, and, and this is kind of a general thing, is oftentimes there's not so much money for that monitoring the the money is more for doing the project and uh if certainly if there was an ngo that <clears throat> was good at finding money to do the actual monitoring um i suppose it's possible um but uh i i i think my general feeling is that probably the agencies would be better at that just because um <clears throat> we tend to focus a little more on the science part of it and uh but there is different ways and Paul probably has a perspective on this but um it's that's the general general problem and one of the reasons why we don't uh, have a lot of accumulated um institutional knowledge about planting success is because <clears throat> you know oftentimes most of the focus is on doing the restoration itself and not uh specifically with uh doing that long-term monitoring to see how well it's going but it looks like paul has a question yeah well i was just going to suggest you know uh 
how we structure the cash flow in a monitoring effort uh, can vary based on location and who is participating. Uh, in general, what I, I tend to try and do in a situation like this is to define the, 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 the work and the value and then see how to build the coalition to make it happen. You know, especially in a case like this where monitoring is undervalued you know, in the grant market. So you'd be looking for sort of key opportunities, sort of key stories. Uh, and a group, for example, like EarthCore, you know, can do monitoring, but may need supervision, you know, so then you're just looking at just a cost benefit, but maybe there's already an EarthCore crew in motion, you know, that could pick up a task, or maybe there's a, a single actor that's working across multiple parties, you know, through a third party contractor. So all kinds of ways to structure it. I think that the trick is being able to demonstrate the value so you can sell the product and then you can kind of work out the financial details. I think that's the challenge here in some ways. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's helpful. Yep. Adam's asking if you have strategies or examples where standardized monitoring approaches can be applied across different agencies or projects. The first thing that comes to mind is one that I had talked about is was us trying to, uh, between DFW and Ecology, was to come up with a standardized way to measure tow widths um, as a shortcut method to estimate flow needs for some wanted spawning and rearing for different species. And, uh, and, and it was what contributed to us getting into the geomorphological benches. And, and so the original method that was developed by the US Geological Survey, um, and we had gone back and actually looked at the you know, the same sites and found out that the, the tow widths that were being measured weren't always for the same tow. They weren't always for the low bank tow, which is what we theoretically thought was what was going on. Sometimes it was for the middle and sometimes for the high bank. So um, <clears throat> so that that's one example where two agencies came together and helped standardize the method and that publication that I gave of Pacheco and Core um, shows that standardization. So that's that's one good example that it's kind of relevant to what I was talking about today. Um, some other <clears throat> trying to think of some other. Well, I mean, just you know, I used to work a lot when I was in the water science team at at DFW. We did a lot. We had standardized methods. If we did um, the long cut kind of methods like PHAB sim if you you know or the which is physical habitat simulation we had standard kind of standard methods for measuring habitat availability at different flows and then using that and it, integrating that with fish habitat models um, to be able to to estimate <clears throat> what flows were optimal for spawning or rearing for different species and uh and that's that's certainly something that's pretty standardized. And again, DFW and Ecology have done a lot with, with that kind of work over the years. And so and those are examples that I'm very familiar with just because I've worked on them. Um, and I'm sure there's others. And uh, if you want me to address anything, another field in particular, you, you can certainly ask, but those are the first things that I can think of. Yeah. Yeah, and Paul is typing some answers into the question box as well. Okay. I think there's a good point in here that everybody wants top quality monitoring data, but nobody wants to fund it. That does seem to be. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and that's what we're hoping to change here. I mean, that's what Paul and I, you know, have been talking about and, and, uh, and others in my program have, will hopefully will be helping with this effort if we can get this going. And uh, so uh, it's the monitoring part is going to be important if we want to be successful, particularly now that we know that these heat, heat domes kill trees. You know, we, we don't want to be going in there and planting something and have it die the next year. So we got to start thinking about 
the upcoming hydrology as part of that planting strategy. And it may even make a difference of what species are planted, when they're planted, and, uh, you know, and if you know a particularly bad year is coming up, maybe it might be better to wait a year before planting. And, you know, we, we have to be more strategic about how we're doing this. If we really want to be successful. It's it's a little bit like, it, you know, sorry, I'm a fish biologist, so I, I tend to think of those kind of examples. But, you know, in, in the old days, when fish hatcheries were, were <clears throat> you know, that oftentimes the fisheries ha hatchery managers they they were mostly interested in getting these fish out, but not necessarily seeing what, you know, the actual, is it actually working or not, you know, and, and so, and that certainly has created a lot of uh, controversy and led to, has led to hatchery reform in the state and everything else, because we, we, we have to integrate those a little better. We can't just say, my job is just to do this and then, you know, Will come what may, we have to actually try to learn to be more efficient and uh, effective at what we're doing so that um, if we come back a few years later, it looks great, you know, and it's, it didn't all die. So that's really, that's where, that's where really where we want to try to get. So we, and I think Paul is trying to put a lot more effort, effort into the monitoring part and, uh, and, and hopefully, <clears throat> Um, as I say, that will lead to better practices in the future. It looks like Paul wants to say something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would just say that uh, I suspect, and this is my hypothesis, right? It's a hypothesis about a social system. That's a, the science. You can't take the scientist out of me on some level, but sure. is that we have not done a good enough job of defining the value and selling that value of monitoring. I think we monitor because we're supposed to. We monitor because it says in this book that you should monitor restoration, but we're not doing, I think, a really good job of defining in the in the realm of the kind of work we're doing, you know, in reveg work. You know, why does monitoring have value? And I think Adam's asking a good question: Is is there are there examples where monitoring data caused you to change your approach, you know, in doing reveg? And I would love to know the answer to that question because that's where we should be focusing, right? So the idea that the scientists can answer that question might not be right. It might be that the practitioners need to figure out the right questions so that then we can sell the concept you know, to funders. And I, so I put some challenge back on us there. It, it, for this to work, we have to get clear. And that's part of what I think you know, Bob presenting today does for us. It says, okay, here's this possibility you know, of distributed experiments. Do we have anything worth asking? Right. If we don't have a if, if vol mortality and treatments for to reduce vol mortality isn't the right question, or there's some other question, you know, what are the right questions that we could actually answer for these methods? Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, that uh, <clears throat> and uh, and hopefully th this process will help answer Adam's question better in the future. This, I mean, the idea is we want to try to get to the standardized monitoring. Um, and uh, come up with uh, a more effective way to, to accumulate knowledge and to act, like I said, I mean, it should be an adaptive management process. And, and hopefully if you ask this question in another year or two, we'll have some better answers specifically for repairing planting. I, that's probably the best that I can come up with right now. Yeah. Um, there's one more question in the, uh, in the question and answer box. Um, is there enough consistency across sites to provide accurate data on which variables most affect the success rate of restoration efforts and what will actually be more effective restoration methodology? Well, yeah, clearly, I mean, we need to do site classification of some sort. And that's a really good question. I didn't get into that, but um, we have to understand <clears throat> what are the differences and similarities in sites before we can effectively, you know, for example, just even knowing what to plant, you know, site conditions are going to determine what makes sense. And, and the practitioners will know a lot more about that kind of stuff than I would, but, uh, and we would need that kind of 
knowledge to to advance but um <clears throat> the i you know clearly we we have to understand we and as i said we this these kind of experiments can figure out what, what these multi like, as i mentioned earlier what the multiple environment try to figure out how to analyze multiple environmental factors but we have to know what environmental factors are important to measure or to assess at sites and i suspect the practitioners will know a lot more about that than um someone like me would and uh and so would be able to help define you know <clears throat> what these what these important factors are I, that again this is you know it's the this is this this whole approach is many heads are better than one and uh and and hopefully the idea is by um kind of um <clears throat> getting people together from different disciplines that we can uh, advance this um learning process that much greater so it's 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 a matter of being a cross disciplinary kind of endeavor and uh in terms i i wanted i did want to say a little more about cuz adam added to his uh, chat um about examples of monitoring data that cause <clears throat> us to change in an adaptive management way i can give you a couple personal examples admittedly fish oriented but um the on in the olympic peninsula the, st the stream that I had studied there for a cut, cut, coastal cutthroat trout, over the years, we saw the building up of the reed canary grass uh, population. And we had let the park know. And uh, and our partner, the 10,000 Years Institute, they were, you know, we were dealing with them as well. And it got to the point where they uh, they agreed that there was a need for reed canary grass control, which is probably part of the reason that the trout run has been declining over the years. And so the the uh, park is doing the reed canary grass control around the lake and uh, 10,000 Years Institute is working in the stream. So that's that's one example. It has a plant tie of it, of where the we I would call it adaptive management where we actually our monitoring data did change you know what kind of management uh, strategy was done another example was in eastern Washington which is a lot drier of course on the east side of the uh, Columbia in Douglas County where we had done uh, trout red surveys and there was a uh, mostly um if we wanted to set flows we tend to set flows higher for spawning than rearing for the different seasons for fish based on their needs and uh and we originally the consultant had suggested that most streams would probably have similar timing but what we found is even within one county we could have in a in a warm groundwater fed stream they could be spawning in late winter, early spring, and in a very cold stream in a different part of the county, um, they where it's the water's really icy cold, they might not be spawning till summer. And this is the same species of fish, rainbow trout. And so there, the adaptive management that we did is, is realizing that we got to actually look at these different streams and uh, and uh, to be able to set flows where we're really focusing on spawning and rearing season, we can't just assume all the streams are the same. And so that's that's kind of another example I would give of in my personal career of trying to use the information to do things differently. And uh, and so um, and certainly I would I, I think we can do this with repairing planting as well. So um, I in terms of I can't give you examples of that one, but I hope this process, and if you ask me in another year or two, I can give a better answer. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Joe had a comment. Um, soil legacies from non-native plant allopathy and nutrient soil water, organic matter alterations, 
is a monitoring consideration. Yeah, no, you know, that's a very good uh, comment. Um, the and I I think some of the practitioners will know about that more than I. I mean, I think I think what's being suggested there is even if you remove the plants, there might still be chemical after effects. And I that's a fascinating topic that I'm not real familiar with yet, but I would want to talk to practitioners about if I'm involved in this project um, to try to get a better handle on, I mean, what kind of after effects there could be from that. And uh, I, I'm certain there, there's pe other people in the audience that can answer that question better than I. And uh, I don't know, I see, I see Jill's, Jill Silver from 10,000 Years Institute is in the a participant today, maybe she would like to answer that better. I think she can answer. She's the one who put the comment in. Oh, she's the one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, that's a good question. I would expect that from Jill. Um, the uh, uh, that is something that is this pro this project progresses. I would have to learn more about that, and uh, that makes a lot of sense. And I. Um, I don't know how long those after effects occur, but that's a really good question. So, yeah, that's something I, um, for to figure out later, I think. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Bob. Um, we're scheduled for a five minute break now, mm -hmm. and everybody come back at 11 for our next speaker. All right. Thank well, you. Th thanks for uh, listening to what I had to say. <laughs> okay. Our next speaker is Jason Hall. Uh, Jason is a senior scientist with Kramer Fish Sciences and has over 20 years of experience in fisheries research and restoration effectiveness and status and trends monitoring. He has worked on numerous projects focused on salmonid ecology and habitat use, life history diversity, life cycle modeling, biotelemetry, and habitat restoration from headwater streams to nearshore environments. His talk is titled Deep Planting with Poles in Ecosystems with High Water Stress. Well, first off, uh, thank you for the invite. I um, appreciate the opportunity to be able to dust off this uh, project. I'm fond of this project from years past and um, excited to share some of the findings from this with you guys. First, I want to acknowledge that this was a project that I developed when I worked with the uh, Northwest Fishery Science Center and the Watershed Program. Uh, it was uh, funded by a variety of agencies and included some collaborations between NOAA, BPA, uh, as well as the Park Service, um, and had many contributors to the project from planting and monitoring, um, as well as uh, partners in experimental design and data analysis. So I just wanted to acknowledge the contributions from a uh, a lot of uh, folks on this project. So just to start off, I wanna give a little bit of uh, background and um, what our objective was in this study. So uh, as many of you are aware in dry land ecosystems, we have some significant stressors and challenges to establishing riparian vegetation, including uh, water stress, uh, channel incision, and uh, herbivore or browser pressures. Uh, this uh, picture is an image from Bridge Creek just showing some of the um, typical dry land ecosystem with, uh, with channel incision. Um, supplemental irrigation is expensive and not always practical in all applications. It's another uh, challenging aspect to planting in dry land ecosystems and uh, channel incision specifically as shown in this picture here uh, creates lowered water tables um, that can limit uh, planting opportunities using traditional methods to uh, inset floodplains. And this actually creates a, another issue uh, in that the inset floodplains can uh, concentrate and channelize flow, which can further impact the uh, resilience or uh, increase the vulnerability of plantings inside the inset floodplains. So, as part of a larger restoration uh, and monitoring effort that was occurring in the uh, in the John Day, we sought to develop uh, and evaluate a strategy that could be used to establish riparian vegetation in a dryland ecosystem with incised channels 
lowered water tables, and no supplement irrigation. Our research questions with this study were specifically to determine and evaluate uh, deep planting as a method to establish riparian vegetation on these high terraces up to two and a half meters above the uh, stream bed elevation in these uh, dryland environments with lowered water tables associated with channel incision and without the use of supplemental irrigation. And also uh, to test whether or not protection methods could be used to both reduce browser damage and increase survival. Uh, the image on the right shows uh, some of the picturesque environment around Bridge Creek where we were working, uh, specifically the Painted Hills uh, John Day Fossil Beds National Monument. You can see it's very dry environment there. Um, and then the two images on the, on the side here are showing uh, the deep planting method in the um, elevated terraces above the stream bed that lack uh, typical riparian vegetation dominated by sagebrush, etc. Um, and then uh, the Bridge Creek, just an example of incision again there. But I just want to make sure that uh, we're on the same page here. So when I'm talking about deep planting, I'm talking about using augers or other tools to plant live poles um, deeper than you would with traditional methods, uh, but providing them with, uh, or at least the goal is to provide them access to either the lowered water table or soils deeper down that have a higher soil moisture. So these, uh, both the deep planting aspect and the protection uh, aspect were key research questions uh, that we sought to answer with our experimental plantings to help develop a riparian planting plan that was more effective than what had been being used in the area, which was planting short live poles along the narrow band of the stream that typically got blown out with uh, seasonal high flows. <clears throat> so we focused on uh, a 4.5 kilometer stretch of Bridge Creek and the Painted Hills National Monument. This section is heavily incised has little riparian vegetation. It's mostly dominated by narrow leaf willow. Uh, this aerial image shows kind of the span of our 36 experimental plots, which were spread out on terraces that um, were up to two and a half meters above the stream bed elevation. So pretty high above the, the stream bed for Bridge Creek. We had three phases of plantings. And, and this is uh, actually an example of where our monitoring results were used to inform our experimental design and our um, and our planting strategy. So our first phase occurred in 2008. I mentioned this was from a while ago, uh, but uh, we used the deep planting method and tested uh, with and without water table penetration, and then tested two shelter treatments with uh, assignments at the plot level. And then in phase two, we had two years of planting where we only planted in holes that penetrated water table uh, in, 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 uh, during drilling and then uh, tested additional shelter treatments with some random assignments. And then in phase three was our sort of implementation phase of what we determined was the best planting strategy um, where we just tried to get a baseline for uh, or an example of how that would go in implementation. So in the following slides, I'll, I'll give a couple uh, a little more detail on some of the, the treatments. So with deep planting, again, we used uh, backhoe in this case, mostly we also used a one meter handheld motorized auger for some of the um, lower elevation terraces. But uh, generally th that was our strategy for penetrating the water tables uh, on terraces up to two and a half meters above the stream bed. We used dormant pole cuttings of black cottonwood, willow, mix of willow species, and some red osier dogwood. And we actually did test some bare root uh, alder stuff, but very limited and don't present any results on that. Um, but our planting generally occurred in the spring. We soaked poles in the, in the creek for at least 24 hours, did some trimming. Uh, what I wanna really note here is that we use poles uh, zero and a half, or so 0 0.5 meters up to 2.3 meters. Uh, average is 1.2 meters. So these are pretty big live poles and um, in the phases we 
that I mentioned in the previous slide, we planted over a thousand poles with each of these efforts. So it was it was pretty intensive, um, and we also included the browser protection treatments as as I mentioned. Um, but this was not only designed to uh, look at ways to protect the plants from browser damage, um, as mentioned in the uh, in the previous talk. And we have things like beaver, also um, cattle, not particularly in this area uh, because of the national monument status, but uh, there's other browsers, elk um, and whatnot, pronghorn, that uh, significantly zero in on these, uh, these plantings, especially in places where there's um, not a lot of riparian vegetation. And so we, we sought to test that aspect of it, but also in a dryland environment, we're dealing with evapotranspiration um, and water stress in general, and some of these shelters are designed to reduce that. And so we, in our first phase, included unprotected plantings, uh, three-foot plastic tree shelters that are designed to protect from browser damage as well as provide um, water stress protection by reducing evapotranspiration losses, and then uh, six-foot circular fence cages, uh, primarily designed to protect from browsers. And then we, uh, in the second phase, adapted our three-foot plastic tree shelter with a uh, five-foot mesh shelter on top, and then also tested a uh, taller plastic tree shelter, a six-foot plastic tree shelter. In the last phase, we transitioned to just using six-foot plastic tree shelters, which I will, uh, which you'll understand why we did that in the next few slides. So these slides uh, cover the results of our experimental planting. So in the first phase, uh, we had some pretty clear results. The plots on the left shows proportion of survival by the uh, water table penetration treatment as well as the shelter. And you can see with the red star there highlighting, we had significantly higher survival for plants that were, or poles that were planted with deep planting and access to the water table and protected by a three foot plastic tree shelter. It was pretty clear. Um, but when you look at the plot on the right, you see that the uh, percent or proportion of plants that were browsed was actually still pretty high with the three foot plastic tree shelters and the circular cages there in the middle, the CC uh, treatment had the, uh, the lowest rates of browse damage in the, in the first three years of, of monitoring. And so, um, while deep planning appear, appeared to provide access to the water table and protecting those with three foot plastic tree shelters significantly increased survival, we still had um, pretty high browser damage for our three foot plastic tree shelters. So in the phase two of the project, we explored some ways to uh, take advantage of that survival benefit from the plastic tree shelters combined with the deep planting method um, and increase our herbivore protection. Should note also that the circular cages, I'm sure everybody's familiar with, are a pain in the butt to install. They're heavy um, in the backcountry. Takes a lot of effort to get all that material out there compared to a light plastic tree shelter and they're typically more expensive to deploy. So um, this has a number of potential benefits for this kind of application at least. But uh, so we explored this five foot mesh shelter on top of the, the um, uh, plastic tree shelter and an attempt to increase the protection from uh, browser damage, but also the six foot plastic tree shelter, see if uh, that would ultimately help us address the issue. So these plots on the left here show the results of our survival on the top. You can see pretty comparable survival among the, the treatments. Um, and then the pot on the bottom, you can see that both the three foot plastic tree shelter with the mesh shelter and the six foot plastic tree shelter significantly reduced browser damage. But as I show in this uh, picture here, we actually had quite a hard time uh, keeping the, plastic, or the, the uh, mesh shelters attached to the poles with the high wind environment, or it could have even been the browsers themselves dislodging them. Um, we had a lot of broken stakes and uh, found a lot of plants like this where the, the um, mesh shelter had collapsed and resulted in some damage to the plants. So ultimately we decided that the best combination was a six foot plastic tree shelter with deep planting, providing the plants with access to the lowered water tables um, and protecting them with the six foot 
plastic tree shelter providing both the survival benefits and the browser protection benefits. So in the third phase, we ramped this up in full scale, um, did a mix of willow and cottonwood, went throughout these uh, experimental planting area and planted over a thousand poles this way and then came back a year after just to sort of do a benchmark check and we found that um, our plants had 67 to 73 percent survival terminal bud damage was minimal at two to four percent of the plants um, and heights uh, ranged right around a, a meter and um, we also noted that survival was significantly higher for willow compared to cottonwood but overall survival rates were pretty darn good considering where we were planting and the conditions we were planting um, and without water and so um, I just want to note that, that, that at least this part of the study, all this information that I presented so far uh, are described in more detail in a couple of publications that we did put together. The citations are there for your reference if you're interested in getting more information on that. But um, I also wanted to share with you, uh, since moving to Kramer Fish Sciences from the Northwest Fishery Science Center, I had the opportunity of helping with a action effectiveness monitoring study it was being run by Kramer uh, a couple of years ago. And, uh, uh, you know, the monitoring officially ended for that project in 2012, but we went out and did some additional monitoring in 2018 as part of an extensive post-treatment analysis that looked at 41 planting sites, uh, two to 24 years post-treatment. So the Bridge Creek study that I designed when I was with NOAA uh, was right at about seven years post treatment. And um, among all these sites, the you know, EPT study that we were doing that included the Bridge Creek site included many different planting methods that were used, but the Bridge Creek sites were the only ones that included deep planting and also provided uh, an opportunity to present some updated results with respect to survival and how, how things have been going, because um, I think we're all kind of generally interested in the, the long term results of um, planting strategies and while the you know couple of years post planting can provide some some information where we all know that riparian planting and just planting in general is a is a long game uh, you might not see benefits the kind of benefits that you're designing the projects to provide uh, for decades after you after you do the planting so this is really where the the fun is and so this, uh, this image here is from those surveys. I got to go out and survey the site with um, our crew. This is in 2018. Um, and these were uh, on a terrace. It was about 1.9 meters above the stream bed. And you can see for size reference there, um, our field crew, these uh, cottonwoods are doing quite well. These particular ones were protected with a uh, six foot circular cage, um, still there, as you can see. Uh, but the plots on the right show uh, the results of that EPT monitoring effort. And the design of that study was comparing uh, treatment reach, in this case, a, a reach that had been planted with riparian plants to a reach that had not, uh, or control. And so the results of that study found that uh, in, in this uh, site, there's a higher abundance of woody riparian plants compared to the control reaches. Um, the top plot shows abundance by different species. And then uh, the bottom plot shows a higher species diversity richness compared to control reaches. So uh, I thought this was, this was very fun to go out and see all this uh, grown up uh, riparian plots uh, from the study. And that was, that was pretty, pretty cool. Also noted some other anecdotal observations. Uh, the picture on the left shows some observations of natural recruitment and expansion occurring in the understories. So uh, there's some local shading and microclimate stuff potentially going on there, which is indicative of some um, improving or uh, attaining repairing functions. And then on the right, you can kind of see how we're starting to see some shade forming um, at the uh, the floodplain terrace level and and also some potential for contribution to bank stabilization. You can see a, a small incised channel bank here, um, which presumably those plants on the on the terrace would potentially help stabilize as the
channel moves around. And then lastly, for a little bit of fun here, I put together a slideshow of uh, a time series from Google Earth. We did not have our LiDAR or drone imagery for this site at the time. Um, that was just not something we were collecting at that point in time, but we do have some cool images from Google Earth that I just wanted to step through. This is 2005 pre-planting, looking at a section inside the, the planting area, and you can see there actually are some pretty um, vegetated areas inside the inset floodplain, again, mostly dominated by uh, the narrow leaf willow, uh, but you can see the, the uh, elevated terraces are pretty much devoid of riparian vegetation, um, mostly grasses and, and scrub steps. So uh, this is the last year of planting in 2011 and also a horrible aerial image, uh, but you can see generally the same lack of vegetation in the floodplain terraces. And here you can actually, two years post planting in 2013, you can actually see some of our uh, experimental plots in a, in a grid, Those that pattern kind of pops out a little bit easier for the eye, but there's also some other planting plots that you'll see uh, more visible in the later imagery. So three years post planting, 2014, you can start to see more of those trees growing up as well as some shading. And again, 2017, uh, you can see those developing even more. And then lastly, in 2020, those, those really pop out, um, especially with the shading there, but you can see those uh, coming up. And so, I thought this was really cool. All of this was done again without supplemental irrigation. This is just drilling into the uh, floodplain terrace at that elevated uh, elevation above the stream bed and uh, providing access to the lowered water table. Uh, cottonwood and willow are particularly adapted following water tables as they draw. So the premise we were hoping for is that if we can at least just give them access to the water table, they can follow it, uh, put their roots out wherever they wherever they need to. But there wasn't a lot of information in the literature at the time to really suggest whether or not this was a effective method given the, the height above the uh, stream bed that we were trying to plant and establish riparian vegetation. And also um, a sidebar to the study was there's a lot of beaver restoration going on in this area too. And so uh, being able to provide riparian vegetation in these uh, terraces as well as the inset floodplains can help support beaver, which then presumably would uh, help with the channel incision process through their dams and sedimentation processes and all their engineering stuff that they do. So just to wrap things up, uh, you know, we asked the question, can deep planting be used to establish riparian vegetation on high terraces with lower water tables and without irrigation? Uh, our results pretty, uh, strongly supported yes to that, but uh, we found that it was best when combined with a plastic tree shelter, presumably to help with the uh, evapotranspiration. It worked on terraces up to two and a half meters above the stream bed. We didn't try much higher than that, but it's possible it could work uh, where you start to get soil moisture through capillary action. It can actually raise, or, uh, raise the water table elevation relative to the stream bed. Um, and it worked for live poles up to 2.3 meters long. The herbivore protection methods, again, we found that the circular cages provided the best protection as well as the six foot plastic tree shelters. But the six foot plastic tree shelters are cheaper, easier to install and increase survival. And uh, I'll tell you, it was much funner to carry a case of uh, a rack of six foot plastic tree shelters three miles in a national monument uh, compared to dragging rolls of circular fence cage out there. Um, and so I guess the, just to close, I know uh, this is, we're talking uh, with the, you know, Skagit context here uh, or the West or wet side context here. But, uh, you know, one question I just want to propose is whether or not this method has applications in um, non dry land environments when, you know, we have we have terraces, high terraces associated with floodplains and many of the systems over here, and they may similar, similarly be affected by water stresses in the summer. And so it's uh, possible that the deep planting methodology would be applicable in this side um, as well, or in the, the wetter environments. And so I just wanna put that out there. And with that, I'll 
close and ask if there's any questions. Um, we have some questions in the Q&A. Um, the first one is, what was the width of your auger specs for your stakes and um, where did you source your stakes? Ah, good questions. Okay, so last one first, uh, we got the stakes from Clarno. Um, it was a local nursery in the area. So they were all local nursery stock propagated from, um, they were cropped uh, from their, their stock. And, and so we tried to plant stuff from, from the area. And then uh, let's see the other question. I think it was a, uh, it was a six inch wide auger on the uh, backhoe mounted auger and the hand power or the motorized hand operated auger, I believe was a, a two inch auger. And what was the third question? Sorry. Um, where did you get the stakes? Did you answer that one already? Yeah, Clarno, the Clarno nursery. Clarno. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Brenda asked the same question. What was the range of diameters of your poles? Mm. The poles or the auger? I thought it was the auger question. I think both are asked. Okay. Um, so I answered the auger question. I'd have to go back and look at the papers. We we uh, summarized the diameters of the of the live poles, but I I believe they were mostly uh, under two inches in diameter. It's hard to it's hard to plant that long of a a live pole without getting some thickness to those. Um, Laura asks if you experimented with clusters of dense planting of large poles. And she says, I've often found the critters will harm the outside edge plants, but can't as easily access the center of the plots. Oh, interesting. To see an experiment um, like that. Yeah, no, we didn't, we didn't look at that. We did actually take GPS points on every plant with RTK and um, I had a note on a previous slide that each plant was individually ID'd with a tag. So it's possible the answer to that question might be addressed by looking at some of that data because when we went back and monitored, we recorded, um, we recorded browser damage at the individual plant level and you could look at the outside of plots versus the interior for one, but no, no specific elements designed to test that with this, but that would be interesting. Um, to reduce plastic use, are there any options for tree shelters that provide the same protection but are biodegradable material? Oh, good question. I, th I think some of the plastic tree shelters are designed to be degradable, but honestly, they don't seem to go away, especially in these dry land environments. Um, that's actually a significant maintenance step. They're designed, they're perforated, they're designed to rip open when the when the tree outgrows them. But I think the more proactive strategy is to plan some uh, retrieval and cleanup associated with that. But even with that, we found that some of the, the pulse flows cause scour and we lost plants to flow as well as and Beaver found some of the materials quite useful for their dam building, and they just stole the whole thing. Um, and so we they, we inadvertently ended up with uh, plastic tree shelters and supplies in the river and whatnot. So um, now those are things definitely to consider. Did you see a difference in survivorship between the wire fences, plastic tree shelters? In survival, yes. The survival was significantly higher with a plastic tree shelter than uh, the wire fences. And again, we, we hypothesized that that was because of the additional benefits for reduced evapotranspiration that the shelters provide compared to the fence cages. And how much evapotranspiration would be expected from the willow and cottonwood trees at more than 20 feet height? And is there any influence on the free water in Bridge Creek from the plantings? Uh, yes, that, that's a good question. We actually did have groundwater monitoring wells in these plots. I, I suspect that they're no longer monitored. Um, I think I was the one doing that. And 
uh, those are probably not active anymore, but that would be that would be something you'd probably have to address with an additional study, but it's something you could do with a similar plan um, if you continued groundwater monitoring or maybe took uh, <clears throat> spot samples at various points uh, with um, with monitoring wells. Here are two questions. Did crews conduct any vegetation management around the plantings and were there any impacts from small rodents? Uh, no vegetation management in the area that I'm aware of, um, not during the first three phases, especially. Uh, I don't know about since. Um, and as far as rodent damage, yes, we did notice uh, some rodent damage and it was noted in our monitoring database, but it was not very prevalent. So we didn't, um, didn't report on anything there. And how do you recommend the cheapest, best way to determine water table and depth for deep planting? Pilot holes prior to planting and later? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so we, so as I said in the beginning, uh, our first phase was kind of more experimental, including this deep planting methodology. So we specifically planted in holes that did not penetrate the water table and as well as those that did. And we simply determined that from the tailings. Um, when we pull up the auger, or uh, we had a, um, it's a, a water quality monitoring tool. It's a uh, basically a tape that has um, like a measuring tape that has mark demarcations on it for distance or length, um, and it's weighted at the end, but it has a sensor at the bottom of it. And so when, when it touches water or moisture, it buzzes. And so we could use that, but generally you can tell from the tailings whether or not you hit wet soil or uh, water and then um, and then we could we could do that and so when we moved into the other phases of the project we uh, transitioned to just doing that uh, putting in pilot holes in some terraces you might imagine because of geomorphology and soils and other things um, we found some old oxbows uh, that retained some subsurface flows that appear and we were able to plant in areas and so we kind of did that with uh, with our later phases where we were able to drill pilot holes and find where we were able to penetrate the water table on these terraces. Um, elevation wasn't always the, the key factor, like I said there, um, but that's a pretty effective strategy and it's pretty easy to determine, at least in the soils out there when you hit water. If you had soils that are more prone to collapsing and don't retain after an auger, it might be harder to both plant and determine if you are in uh, wetted soils. What happens with plastic protectors as the tree grows? Oh, so I mentioned that they are perforated, so they're designed to rip. Um, that doesn't always happen well. And so, like I said, I, I think it's best to have a proactive strategy to plan to go out and um, remove those, but they are designed to presumably rip when they when they open. We, we found some during this later monitoring where they were still uh, on and the tree hadn't quite ripped them. And so um, I'm not sure it's the best practice to let them do their thing. Probably better to go out there and remove them, but you have to plan for that. And Paul asks, did you consider the water jet stringer method? Or do you suspect if it would serve a similar function without the backhoe? Um, interesting. I will have to look at that link. Um, is that a relatively recent article? Uh, it's been a mm -hmm. while since I did this project, but uh, I'm not familiar with that. But I can kind of envision what that is. It's basically just a pressure, using a pressure washer and a long thing to drill the hole rather than the force of the backup. Yeah, so I mean, the only the only thing I would perceive being difficult there is you wouldn't be able to determine whether or not you penetrated the water table because you made everything wet. Um, so if you have some idea of what kind of water table elevations you're dealing with or how deep you need to plant them, um, then that might be worth experimenting with that. I, I just haven't 
looked at that, but good idea, good thought. What did you fill in the rest of the hole with after installing a pole? My crew uses a muddy slurry when planting shorter live stakes. Uh, good question. We actually just use the tailings from the um, the hole itself. There was some cases where we got into some more clay soils. As you remember, the picture I showed you of the Painted Hills National Monument, there's actually quite a bit of clay out there. And there's also a Mazama ash layer that's pretty thick out there. So when we weren't able to reuse the tailings from the hole itself, um, and we, we would put those in and then uh, compress it so that we wouldn't end up with a, like if you just collapse the top of the hole over, you end up with a big air pocket um, in that in that hole. So we took care to push the soil down through the auger hole around the light pole. And uh, where we ran out of soil, we simply just used soil from the banks of the incised stream bed, um, readily exposed, so easy to access and uh, fill from soil on site. But we didn't do anything specific to make it wet or more wet or less wet. <laughs> Have you found the NRCS web soil survey or other tools to predict water table depth in uh, project planning? Or how have you have you found the NRCS wet soil survey or other tools? Ooh, I have not looked at that. I, I wouldn't have any insight on that, but I, I presume that along with some local area monitoring would probably be useful and helping inform. Um, but if you have the tools, it's easy to just drill some pilot holes. Um, but I mean, from a planting plan development perspective, it's, it's best to kind of have as much of an idea of what you're going to be dealing with before you go out there either way. So you have the right supplies to test, but I have not used that tool. How did you start this project? Get involved with Craig? Oh, um, that, so I assume, is that talking about the project when it was started or the, uh, yeah. So I was speaking, I'll assume that. So this was, I was involved with the Bridge Creek restoration project. And like I mentioned, there was one aspect of it that was focused on beaver restoration. We were actually planting uh, beaver dam analogs in the channel to, provide them a structure to work with. And the goal was to um, support restoration of the incised channels, bring start the processes, bring the channels up and uh, reconnect them with their disconnected floodplains and terraces. And another aspect of that was uh, riparian planting, but the original, the previous methods were planting tens of thousands of live poles, but just along the stream bed and those were getting blown out. And there's, they've been doing that for years and years and years. And there was just nothing much to show for it on the, um, in Bridge Creek. And so I came into the project and one of my goals was to uh, try and figure out a way that we could get riparian vegetation established on these uh, disconnected terraces um, without requiring a bunch of irrigation and just sort of prepping the stage for getting this going uh, and in the long-term objective of reconnecting the creek with the floodplain as it grades and um, also providing potential source of input for beaver as well as uh, largely debris and other um, shading, other processes to support long-term recovery. So that's, that's why I got, that's how I got involved in in that project was to try and answer this uh, particular research question. Um, and then somebody put in a comment about the water jet stringer. Um, it would be able to make a pilot hole about six feet deep. Okay. Um, and then the next question is, do you think planting with longer stakes could be worth it in wet regions? even if the length of the stake is more than enough to reach the water table? In other words, would it be unnecessary in water, water regions? I don't know. Um, I had some concerns about the longer poles um, 
and rot in the soil, but uh, it it seems it seems like uh, based on particular this image from uh, seven years later that things seem to be doing well. The active growth they're continuing to grow. They're established pretty well, but I suspect that can I feel like at least that concern would be more um, in an environment that's wetter in general, and so it would it would potentially warrant some testing and investigation and in our area to to ask those questions. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Um, I think it's really encouraging to see the successful establishment in the dryland ecosystems, especially thinking about the pattern we have of long, longer summer drought on the west side. Uh, there's a lot to learn for sure from the restoration work going on in the adjacent ecosystems in other parts of the northwest. Next up is Anthony Waldrop. Uh, he's going to talk about some of the innovative applications of live pole planting. So kind of on a similar topic, how to apply the, uh, the pole system. Anthony is a watershed restoration project manager for the Grays Harbor Conservation District. And he works with stakeholders throughout the Chehalis Basin to implement watershed restoration projects and programs. Anthony, we're all looking forward to hearing your experiences in these projects with managing landowner expectations, reducing erosion, and some of the innovative and lessons learned uh, that you've done with, with the live pole planting. Great. Uh, no, this is perfect um, sort of follow up on what Jason was sharing um, and some of the questions that were coming out of that. Uh, really cool to see the, the experimental work that went in on the live pole planting. I know as, as we were as we've been exploring this uh, in Grace Harbor uh, area in the Chehalis Basin, um, some of those uh, research papers were really important for us to um, be able to check our assumptions and, and help us develop projects. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna be um, talking about, uh, yeah, the different applications of live pole planting that we're exploring. We're still relatively new to using this technique. So um, we don't have, uh, uh, a large robust set of um, results from uh, different projects, but um, we've got some and, and I'm excited to just share some of those results. The main project that I'll be focusing in on is the Satsup River Mile 3.5 Erosion Reduction Pilot Project. Um, this uh, project, the, the Satsup River flows out of the um, um, the, the Southern Olympic Mountains um, and gets uh, quite a bit of, um, uh, its watershed gets quite a bit of rain during, during the winter. Uh, it's mostly rain that's pretty low, um, not a lot of snow um, historically in this watershed. I think highest elevations, three, four, 3,000, maybe up to 4,000. Um, so very rain dominated, very um, uh, powerful system. Um, and um, in this system, um, there's a, a, a number of areas that are facing fairly extreme erosion. Um, as you can see in these aerial photos at this site, um, this, uh, this piece, this parcel had, um, I think it was, you know, in some spots, 300 foot riparian buffer of uh, about 80 plus year old um, riparian trees. And then um, in some areas, uh, much, much more of, of that. Um, and then over the, over the course of the past 30 years that that buffer has gone away um, and the river is uh, eroding through uh, her pasture land. This landowner has a grass fed beef farm, obviously concerned about uh, the viability of her farm and that continued erosion through the pasture and also potential threats to her home and farm infrastructure. Um, interesting for, for this one, she was a, a beef supplier to the Seattle Seahawks, which was a, an interesting anecdote that she shared one time. Um, but uh, yeah, so big erosion issues here. Um, and a lot of that is due to the Satsup River being incised. It has a pretty large natural sediment source, uh, bed load source from the um, Continental Glacier Outwash, outwash that comes from the East Forks Satsup uh, Mason County area. Um, 
it uh, lacks stable large woody debris, uh, old growth riparian, and uh, as I mentioned before, can have pretty extreme uh, floods and changes in stage. Um, so a lot of landowners in this river valley have challenges with erosion, um, with extreme erosion, especially where it's greater than 50 feet perpendicular to the stream per year. For this particular area, and you know, due to this like, extreme erosion, we're working with this landowner and a couple other landowners on um, a large woody debris, riparian buffer reestablishment project, floodplain reconnection. Um, but as we all know, due to design and permitting and funding realities, large woody debris projects can take quite a few years to be implemented. And in the meantime, land is being continually eroded away at fairly rapid rates with an eventual goal of riparian buffer reestablishment and all the benefits that come from that. Um, we don't wanna plant and see them wash away in an event that takes out a hundred feet of, of buffer. So we wanted to figure out some early project actions that we could do while we continue working on this larger project. Some actions that um, might help reduce erosion, um, but that um, have a better chance of sticking around than the typical um, three to four foot live stakes or, or other riparian plantings um, that uh, um, are not going to withstand uh, the flood flows, especially in an incised system for very long. So we've got this long-term project, which is exciting, but we wanted to see if there was any early actions that we could do to save um, or to reduce, reduce that erosion in the near term. So as a pilot project, we decided to try out a more robust live staking uh, technique, um, very similar to the, the deep planting that Jason mentioned. Based off of the, the, the flood flows and the height of the bank, um, we decided that putting in six foot to 10 foot long willow and cottonwood poles with around a three inch diameter down to depths of four to seven feet um, would give us a, a chance to help uh, get uh, roots established throughout that um, potentially erodible soil column. Our hypothesis was that if we could get them established in late winter and early spring, um, after the most erosive floods, because that, that's what they happen in winter or fall and winter, um, so establish them after the most erosive floods, um, and hopefully they would put those roots out and, and then be resilient to water stress uh, due to their depth. Um, like like uh, Jason was talking about, like water stress is getting more and more important or more and more of an issue, um, even in um, extremely wet uh, Grace Harbor County. And then for, as far as spacing, we space them 10 feet apart with about a 10 foot to 20 foot setback from the existing bank line to ideally give them a bit of room before the river gets to them, especially since we were doing it during times of potential high flows. We knew that the erosion might not be um, over yet and we wanted to um, to get them established before the, the river started to interact with them. To get them to depth, we used a one person gas powered auger for the first few feet and then a, a pneumatic post pounder to drive the posts as deep as possible. We needed this technique to be quick to implement, not involve heavy equipment due to the really wet site conditions. Um, also, you know, once you start bringing in equipment that can necessitate permits and, and, and that extends your, your timeline. And we wanted to have a chance of erosion reduction. We knew that this technique wasn't going to solve the rapid erosion issues, but even if it didn't, um, it, any poles that would survive would initiate our riparian buffer establishment goals anyways. So it was a really nice uh, low risk early, early action to take. So in, installing this low risk early action was also really important for landowner engagement for this project. Taking this action showed her that we were you know, trying to be as creative and proactive as possible at addressing her major concern, which is the erosion. Um, she definitely cares about the riparian and the salmon, uh, but her her highest concern was, you know, my um, I had a I had a 300 foot buffer. That buffer is gone, um, and uh, it's now threatening um, uh, farm infrastructure and taking out um, acres and acres of of land that she previously relied on. Um, so her concern is how do we get how do we get this erosion 
to a more manageable state. She knows that um, rivers naturally erode and that we're not gonna be able to stop erosion. We just wanna reduce it and, and allow the river to, um, to be able to migrate in, um, in its more natural way in, within a corridor. So we're taking this early action at the same time as working on the high permit, high cost engineered log jam option. It, this implementation allowed our team to start to form project implementation relationships with the landowner as a sort of dry run for the uh, eventual large construction project. Excuse me. Going from design and permitting, um, which often has little to no ground impact for landowners to a full construction effort can be really jarring for a lot of landowners and constrain relationships and communication quickly. So doing this project allowed us to start to work through construction related communication scenarios with uh, much lower stakes, pun intended. Um, these pics show our installation in February, 2022. You can see the, the auger holes on the left and the right. Um, and after augering, we placed the poles in and then brought the pneumatic post pounder to come along and finish them off by pounding them as deeply as we could. The pneumatic post pounder is a really great tool because it's extremely mobile. We use them for post assisted log structures and also for installing these larger poles. Um, the air compressor can be staged at a stable landing site more than a thousand feet away and then hose can be run from the compressor to the pounder. And all you have to do is move around the hose and the filter regulator cart. Um, also in contrast to say a gas powered pounder, you don't have to hold the post pounder while it pounds. You simply place it on the post, you step back like Jeff is doing here in this picture and pull the trigger and the weight does the work. It saves a ton of energy for the crew implementing it. So here's some, some metrics on um, what we ended up installing. Um, we ended up putting in about 350 uh, cottonwood and willow poles. We also, um, because there was a bit of a plantable toe that developed during low water, um, we uh, opportunistically uh, harvested a bunch of willow stakes from the same um, property and installed them as the sort of chasing the water uh, during spring as, as the groundwater or as the water flow went down. We spent about 170 crew hours. It was about a week and a half of crew time. Um, and this was a uh, the stretch of shoreline was 1500 feet. So about a quarter of a mile, a little bit more. Um, overall project cost uh, was 14,600. The main portions being the, the plant material at 5,100 and the labor at 6,100. Um, the post pounder we rented for a couple of weeks um, and it was um, uh, fairly uh, affordable uh, from uh, Herc Rentals uh, in our area. And then we had a little bit of money set aside for monitoring and, and being able to report out our results. And um, wanna acknowledge as well the Chehalis Basin Strategies Erosion Management Pilot program that funded this project. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of the different applications that, um, or the, the different benefits of this type of work that we're seeing beyond the erosion reduction. So here we can see you know, the growth season um, uh, starting in April, excuse me, going into July, and then I've got some pictures later of September. Um, one really nice outcome of using these larger poles was that they were very competitive with reed canary grass and some other pretty aggressive riparian weeds. With no maintenance, uh, many of the poles were able to thrive because they could access the deeper groundwater. They started growth a bit earlier in the spring, and then they, they continued to grow later than most of the weed vegetation, which died off during the summer drought. So that gave them a competitive advantage on both of those shoulder seasons, um, and they were able to hold their own um, in their first year with uh, the rest of the, the vegetation. Another um, application is in a lot of uh, floodplain <clears throat> environments that have large woody debris that flows across um, lower, lower floodplains. Um, that can make it pretty difficult to establish um, plants or, or a, a farmer who has to 
uh, pick that up out of their field, oftentimes is, is looking for ways to keep that woody debris on the uh, in the riparian area. And so one <clears throat> ancillary benefit of this, this is a different project here where we use them, is the installed live poles act as a, a, a pseudo flood fence. Um, and um, on the left picture, that those are Douglas fir poles that are that's in a flood fence array. Those those aren't going to grow. Um, and that shows the capture of woody debris. But on the right, we can see one of our poles that was able to withstand a, a fairly large um, um, log that came down the river and hold it there. So I think that's a really exciting potential is um, if you, you put a, a decent array of these, they can help build that riparian woody layer. Another benefit um, on an application is uh, rapid riparian vegetation establishment. So these are some of our September photos um, here of <clears throat> the, uh, on the left you have um, schoolers willow, which um, we measured the length of the, the longest shoots um, and also counted how many stems and um, had a baseline data on the length of pole and how far it was put underground. Um, so both the schoolers willow and the black cottonwood on the right um, were able to get seven to eight feet of um, new growth on, on their longest shoot. Um, and with, with the importance of shade and riparian vegetation along our waterways, it was really encouraging to see this rapid and robust growth. Um, and so we've started to incorporate these poles in many of our riparian projects, even if there's no, you know, there's no erosion issues. Um, the cottonwood especially acts as a really great early successional floodplain species that can provide shade protection for slower growers, such as cedar and spruce. And for our project development, this can help us because a lot of project and funding timelines don't allow for a 10-year planting project or 20-year planting project where you go in and you do your early successional species, get the alder and cottonwood established, and then come in 10, 20 years later and underplant. Um, to get uh, some of the conifer species or species that are slower growing, that um, are more shade adapted. Um, and so with this technique, we can cinch together that temporal, that, that uh, temporal lag there. And um, for, for projects where we, we only have a couple of years of funding and try to establish the diversity um, sooner than later where we get a lot of shade right away and companion plant with um, these cottonwood and um, the, the slower grower species that would benefit from the shading. Um, and hopefully that results in a more diverse and resilient vegetation zone um, from just a, a few years of, of planting. So some of our results here, we were really happy with the survival after one year. Um, and it was uh, over 80%. Um, some of the things that we were finding was there was no difference in survivability between cottonwood, Pacific willow, or schooler's willow, um, or any difference based on pole diameter or length. Uh, what we did find though, was that um, access to water was really important, especially with a really dry summer. Um, so we had a very wet spring last year, wet and cool in 2022, which was great for early growth but then the weather dried out substantially for July to October. And due to the depth of many of our poles, our goal was to get poles down four feet. Um, and many of them were, uh, they continued thriving during that dry period, putting on close to 10 feet of new growth on those st individual stems. However, the poles, some poles that did initially well in the wet spring that put on good growth eventually died during the summer. And looking at our data, we found that this trend was largely driven by depth of pole below ground surface, as well as the substrate. Gravelly substrate, which dries out more quickly, also corresponded with tougher augering and driving conditions. And so in those areas, we were often unable to get three feet below the ground surface. This picture so, shows a section of poles that didn't survive due to the tough driving conditions and the gravelly substrate. But thankfully, those conditions weren't dominant at the site. So it's just a few sections here and there. But the, the ones that went at least four feet into the ground were um, for the most, you know, more than 99% were successful 
at surviving and thriving. So this is a, a, a bit of a snapshot of some of the, the monitoring that we're doing, um, as well as a picture of a, a, a landscape picture of from September showing an area that did quite well, where almost every poll has survived and thrived. The spreadsheet above shows the data we have been gathering. The installation data is on the left, and then the monitoring data is highlighted on the right. With this data, we've been able to draw some conclusions that I've shared today, but we've not yet done a robust analysis of the data, but we hope to eventually publish a white paper that shares out the results a bit more formally. And I'd also be really curious to hear from folks what other data might've been useful to gather as we were you know, moving really quickly on this project and um, trying to gather as much data as we could in, in a short amount of time. Um, and you know, with the conservation district, we're, we're implementers and we have a little bit less uh, experience on the, the monitoring and experimental sides. So we're always open to learning. Um, and you can see here, we've got nice data on, you know, the bark condition, the soil condition, um, the number of stems and um, also other, other various uh, metrics. So back to our original question, um, you know, erosion reduction, are we reducing it? I would say, Yes, as a as a theory, yes, because it's you know it's impossible to measure to what degree at this point because there's so many variables and we you know we didn't establish a control, but we do know that at very little cost we now have woody vegetation roots established uh, throughout the soil column. The eventual large woody debris project will impact the poles a bit and nullify any sort of pure erosion reduction experimental conclusions. We can have over the long term, um, but it will also give us a chance to dig up and reposition the poles. And I hope to do some measuring of root growth, you know, where where the roots are growing the most, um, and and try to get that data, which which is something I've I've been really interested in is are the roots establishing throughout throughout the the, the underground post, um, or is it only in a certain zone? Um, that's really important on the the sort of soil binding that I'm, I'm interested in. Um, this is a, an aerial here of the, the project site that we took a couple weeks ago. And um, the we haven't had the extreme floods this year that we um, often do, and um, which is great because hopefully we'll get another year of growth um, on these before they really get challenged. Um, and I think also those really important to try to get stakes and poles in that sort of toe zone um, if you can. Um, cause that's, that's what we've seen naturally on our rivers around here where you get, uh, live, live vegetation from upstream washing in with a, a slug of gravel getting established at that toe. And then, um, once, once you get vegetation coming up in there, it, it serves to capture sediment and rebuild, um, soil in that area. So that's, that's we're really trying to experiment with both on top of bank and chasing the water as the water goes down. Um, during the, the springtime. And finally, uh, some other conclusions and lessons learned. Um, it's a, a really great, you know, no maintenance or low maintenance technique to incorporate into a lot of our riparian and wetland restoration projects. Um, you know, it's going to differ uh, depending on site conditions, but um, if you need to get for this site, you know, we, we needed to get down more than three feet. And so if we do any additional posts here and we can't get below that, uh, then I think we'd wanna consider either thinning stems to reduce that water need or some summer watering. Um, the ideal size of the material for driving was two inch to three inch. We were, we were a little worried that if we got too skinny that the poles would, uh, wouldn't withstand the the uh, pneumatic post pounder, but um, we found that the two inch ish and above was was totally fine. So um, rather than have the the I think the chuck size for the post pounder was three and five eighths inch, but we really wanted to stay three inch to two inch, and that was that was perfect for it. Um, depending on your local uh, live vegetation suppliers, the size of material could be difficult to source. We our sub local supplier Salix Solutions was great in helping us find um, this and, and uh, providing all of the poles that we needed. Um, it's a great technique for landowner engagement, 
like I've talked before, the rapid reveg, weed competition, drought tolerance. Um, and then for this particular project, um, the erosion potential has definitely been reduced, but um, it's uh, um, in a lot of our sites, we, we need that um, large woody debris and, and incision reduction to help with the overall uh, excessive erosion, um, but a good technique uh, regardless. Um, I just want to acknowledge a, a few um, um, folks and partners and you know, our crews that help, landowner, the erosion management program, and our, our supplier. Um, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Um, so folks in the, in the question box are asking about that pounder. They want to know the details. Um, yeah. Um, what's the di diameter? Did you have to trim down the tops of large posts to get them in? So there was a few of the, the posts. Compressor. That, yeah, there were a few posts that were um, a bit larger than the chuck size that we did have to trim down um, to be able to fit the chuck on. And um, we were, I was pleasantly surprised that those ones that had a lot more sort of um, damage to them in installation, they, um, many of them survived and, and were able to thrive, um, but it just made it more work to, to install them. So working with our supplier, we're, we're really emphasizing like we, we, we want it below this check size because it just takes too much manipulation to get the poles to the size that we can fit the, the pneumatic post pounder uh, on it. So um, the post pounder did not damage the poles substantially enough that um, it uh, re really reduced uh, survivorship. We also did cut the, the tops down a bit to leave a, um, you know, just a couple feet, a foot or two um, up above the soil surface. So if there was damage on the top, then you know if we cut that off. That that helped reduce any potential girdling effect caused by the uh, post pounder. Um, what was the size of the um, compressor? And mm. the size of the compressor and the length of the hose. Yeah, I think we were so. I don't really remember the size of the compressor. You know, the, the, the tool is rated for a certain compressor size, which we made sure to line up. Um, and the, the place that we rented from, um, the Herc Rentals, um, H-E-R-C uh, -E Rentals, um, they provided the compressor as well. And so we were able to work with them to make sure we got the appropriate compressor size. Um, for this equipment. And um, the length of hose, um, I think we were up to around 1,200 feet at the longest. Um, I'm really curious to see how far we can stretch it um, to see, yeah, if there's any, what, what, when we find the limitations for being able to use the equipment. Um, because this, especially with our post-assisted log structures, it's really nice to just run hose when you're, um, down into the uh, riparian buffer areas. And was there tree cover removal from 1991 to 2017? No, that was all, all river. Um, so yeah, kind of definitely land landowner was pretty, yeah, been sad about, you know, losing some pretty prized cedars and, and uh, some trees along there. What was the density of the stakes per acre? Um, we had 10 foot uh, on center spacing. So um, I'd have to do the, the math on that, um, but yeah, 10 foot spacing. Okay, then there were more questions about damaging poles, which you've already addressed. Um, How much time elapsed from harvest to planting of the poles? Um, I would say maybe um, at most a month or two. And you know, the our supplier um, is very conscientious of keeping the poles or harvesting in dormancy, keeping them moist 
um, keeping them alive. And then when we get them, we do the same thing, keep them from drying out. On your follow-up monitoring, it might be interesting to look at whether the cambium was damaged contributing to mortality. So checking out at your, your guess that the trees yeah. survived. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point is, um, yeah, I wish that for each of the, the polls we had a um, sort of like viewing platform or something that you could look at the soil column, see where the roots are going, see what's happening underground, but I think that would be kind of expensive. Have you compared the success of cottonwood stakes with planting larger cottonwood bare root stake stock? Um, haven't made uh, direct comparisons as far as survivability, um, but I think over 80% survivability um, is, I think, uh, um, about what we hope for with any of our live stake material. So I, I would say it's, um, uh, we're right on track. And you know, our goal was 50% survivability because we weren't sure if, or, or that the, the larger material would take as well. So um, it was encouraging to see that the live material is taking, and we're, we're doing some projects with some, you know, um, eight to, to 16 diameter um, cottonwood coming up in a few weeks um, on the Chehalis River, which we're excited to use those as sort of a pseudo flood fence, um, rapid reveg establishment. But those will need, you know, the larger equipment to, to come in. For that so it's it's more expensive. Have you considered using a water jet stringer? So same question. Um, I some of our project partners have um, talked about using the water jet stinger. I think um, I'm still a little bit intimidated by uh, setting it up and also, um, yeah, making sure that uh, we have the right equipment and everything. Um, to do that. So I'm definitely interested um, for using, I've seen it used pretty successfully, but um, haven't yet uh, gone down that route. Um, and how long would you wait to plant conifers in these buckers? Um, I think I kind of like to, um, you know, depend, depending on your, your, your project, um, you know, you can plant conifers sort of right now and see how they do. Um, and then, but, uh, being conscientious to, um, their, if there's a little bit of shade to protect them, uh, they're, they're definitely going to like that. Um, and, uh, so if you get a little bit more shade in a couple of years, um, and, but you're also, you know, you don't have extreme competition for them because uh, early on with cottonwood, willow, all their, those early successional, they can, if they're planted really densely, they can be very competitive. Um, and um, so you just want to be conscientious of that is the, the spacing when you're putting in your, <coughs> uh, your other plants and doing other planting. So yeah, not a, it's very, uh, um, depends on the site, I guess I would say. Are there any other questions? I saw Adam had one in the host and panelists chat. Yes, have we used these techniques oh, yeah. on poorly drained areas? And if so, any changes in drainage you noticed after installation? Um, we have a project coming up um, on a really, really poor soil area, very compacted, um, poor drainage. So um, we'll be able to determine there if this is a, a viable technique in, that, that's, that's one application I didn't, um, forgot to talk about was, you know, really challenging soil conditions. If we can um, get these poles down to groundwater, we might be able to establish some, uh, vegetation in areas where other vegetation, even with watering, is having a hard time getting established. Um, so stay tuned. Um, our next speaker is Brianna Finch. 
She is the Habitat Program Manager at Regional Fisheries Enhancement Group Sound Salmon Solutions. She specializes in vegetative restoration for salmon recovery in the Stillaguamish, Snohomish, and South Island County watersheds. Her talk is titled Mitigation of Reed Canary Grass on Harris Creek. All right, um, thank you. I am, yeah, I'm going to be talking about our planting at Harris Creek uh, in 2022. Um, Harris Creek is located um, right off of the Snoqualmie River. It flows centrally through the Snoqualmie Wildlife Unit, acting as an overflow channel for the Snoqualmie River during flood events. And as you can see, it is a whole lot of reed canary grass. This is pretty much the entirety. As far as the eye can see, it's just kind of one big corridor of, of reed canary grass. And I'm also gonna refer to it as RCG from here on out because it's kind of a mouthful <laughs> to continue saying the full, full name. But um, so we, in this area of Harris Creek, it's saturated most of the year. There's, there's standing water most of the year. So it's just not exactly conducive to trying to control RCG in a way that we would have in the past. Um, so as you've been hearing a lot this morning, we also used uh, live poles, live stakes um, for this planting. Um, it's we're going to be doing it in multi phases. This is the first phase of hopefully many. Um, we have found that it looks like there's about 17 acres of plantable area of just pure RCG along Harris Creek that we'd like to continue planting in the future. Uh, we're starting kind of out in little chunks as we go along, see how the, the plantings work because um, there is a lot of beavers in the area. Um, and it's not exactly the most feasible area to be using tubing or caging, um, considering how many floods are gonna be happening all year and um, the density that we're trying to plant in, it's just not cost effective, time effective to be using caging or tubing. So we're trying a few different methods um, to avoid losing that, canopy that we desire in the planting to shade out the reed canary grass. Um, we're using primarily five and six foot live stakes, um, all a combination of black cottonwood, uh, Pacific willow, and Sitka willow. And hopefully um, we won't, I mean, we're not going to be doing any pre or post maintenance, but the hope is that because all of the live stakes are going to be above weed height at the time of installation that they will then be able to continue to grow and then create that canopy we're looking for. So of course, I mean, as we've heard this morning, the importance of being able to create shade um, on, on the stream, create habitat complexity for the salmon, we're trying to reduce water temperatures, and then hopefully the long, in the long term, the reduction of the RCG will then lead to some natural recruitment of the native riparian vegetation. Um, so we had to kind of tackle the planning of our planting because of the beaver. Um, not that, I mean, the beavers are our friend, as we all know, but of course we do want to be able to create <laughs> that desired canopy. So we tried a few different things. Um, as you can see in the picture that I have here of these kind of circle plots along the map, um, this is actually a map for phase two of, of our Harris Creek plantings, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, but this is kind of the general idea of what we're, um, the, the, the planting plans in terms of doing it in little plot sections, um, because this is on WDFW property. There are a lot of people who hunt waterfowl out in that area. So we were creating some 
view corridors for the hunters so that they weren't then creating them themselves <laughs> as they're going out to hunt and they come out to a, a dense uh, willow planting and take machetes to <laughs> our hard work. Um, so we created kind of like some natural view corridors along with the um, with the line of the creek and what what felt the most natural um, to us as we were planting. And then in these particular plots, we used a very dense um, planting pattern on the first two outer rings. They were about uh, one feet apart, one foot apart from each other. And then we variated the planting in hopes that maybe beaver would maybe not want to squeeze their bodies through the planting and then, you know, consume and start to nibble on the, the remainder of uh, the live stakes in that area. Um, so with this planting, the plan was for five acres at a uh, 1,000 plant per acre density. And the zoning for this um, planting plan, oh, here's a picture of an example of a view corridor. It's kind of hard to see live stakes in a bunch of RCG and <laughs> water, but hopefully you get the idea. Um, as we were planting um, in this sort of density, we realized as we we're coming to the end, we were going to need more live stakes. Um, so we originally had planned on 5,000 live stakes for the five acres, and we ended up purchasing an additional 2,000 live stakes to continue the density that we were planting at. And then in some of our circle plots, we planted a little bit closer together on the inner circle because on the outside we were planting one foot apart spacing and on the inside we were planting five feet apart. In some of our circle plots we were planting three feet apart on the inside, which purchasing those additional stakes allowed us to do that. Um, the planting all together with the 7,000 sticks took three to four crew members 11 days which is pretty quick for a planting. Um, we did have some minor challenges with the varying water levels and how prone that area is to flooding um, and elevated water. The ground is very uneven, very easy for crew members to topple over and top their waders out. Um, and planting in standing water in the middle of February and March is fairly uncomfortable. So, um, I do actually have a few suggestions. I don't know, it seems like a lot of people that might be listening today have implemented plantings such as these, but there are a few things that we learned along the way that have been helpful um, when doing plantings like this, which is this slide. So um, pond gloves come in real handy because um, we were having a lot of crew just completely removing their gloves, which it can be a bit of a, a safety hazard when you're planting in standing water. And sleds, if you aren't using them for your planting, which I know a lot of people are at this point, but if you aren't using them, starch because they come in handy almost all of the time. Um, this picture that I have is actually uh, on the uh, right of the screen is not from our planting at Harris Creek, but yet we were rest we had to rescue some plants out at Cherry Valley after a flood. We had just staged them and it flooded, as you can see, up to the waist. Um, and floods float. And once you put plants in them, they continue to float. So it was kind of an invaluable um, investment for planting. So after a year, um, you know, the, as expected, beavers did come in and um, our density did not, on the outer edges, did not work as well as initially anticipated. However, we did notice quite the pattern um, and it's really hard to see in the pictures that I took after going out there and um, looking at the planting one year later. 
but it looks like they kind of floated in from the creek, um, from the other side of the, the creek and nibbled on, you know, one small section at the beginning of the circle, made their way into the middle of the circle, um, continued to munch on um, live steaks throughout the circle and nibbled their way out the other side. So in a lot of uh, the areas you can see, um, it's really dense in some sections. Um, and then there will be some, some shorter live stakes on one side, not a whole lot of live stakes in the middle and shorter live stakes on the other side. Um, so they were creating their own corridors um, as I am now calling them beaver corridors. So um, we actually have a few different um, plantings going on in the future out at Harris Creek. We're actually going to be doing um, restoration for, if I can get back to the slide, for um, Ducks Unlimited. And uh, CK from Ducks Unlimited is actually the one um, running that particular thing. We're at Sound Salmon Solutions going to be implementing the planting plans. Um, however, um, CK's uh, idea for this was to up the live stakes by, all, well, at this point, it's almost doubling them. And he would like the circle plots to be um, one to three foot spacing pretty consistently rather than doing a dense ring on the outer edge of the plots. Um, and hopefully, and I actually think that based on what it does look like out there, after one year of the beaver um, being able to get to the live stakes, I think that this density of planting is actually going to be pretty great um, for what we're what we're looking for. Um, and then we actually are partnering with um, Jennifer. Oh my goodness, I am not going to remember her name, but we are doing, we are partnering with it for a monitoring assessment. So King County is actually doing a few, has a, a grant for um, monitoring live stake plantings in reed canary grass. Um, and she is going to be doing a monitoring assessment of Ducks Unlimited's planting at Harris Creek. So it'll be interesting um, seeing what ends up happening with that planting. And then we are also doing another um, live stake planting out at Chinook Bend, a natural area. It's a King County owned park. Um, and there is a RCG just laden beaver pond out there. We're gonna be doing a few different test plots. There is going to be some tall live stakes, so some six foot uh, live stake as traditional that we were planting out at Harris Creek. And then we we're also going to be doing some um, 12 foot fascines as well. Um, and a little bit different um, for that particular planting, we are going to be doing one year of herbicide treatment prior to planting um, to see how the live stakes fare after that. Um, and then uh, King County is also going to be doing an assessment of that planting as well. Um, and that's actually all I have. It sounds like I might have finished a little bit early, but I don't know if anyone has any questions. Let's see, Brianna. Um... We have uh, some questions. Did you work with uh, Hunter to determine the best location and size for the openings between planting islands? Did we work with the hunters? Yeah. Um, no, what we did, uh, and I, you know, it's hard to say, I guess we could have put some kind of letter out before plantings and reached out to some hunters, but the way that I approached it was to line the view corridors with the what felt most appropriate to the line of like the understory up um, on the higher bank. Um, 
ways that I was noticing that hunters are actually accessing the creek. So there are some kind of person made trails that are leading down to the bank. We also left a pretty, like I'd say about a five to six foot gap um, along the side of like the higher bank as well so that they could walk along the edge and then access all of the different corridors along the creek. So it seemed like the, the best way to approach them still being able to access those hunting areas. And how deeply did you plant the six foot stakes? Well, at least at least two thirds, usually about halfway. I mean, it was really easy to, to plant out there. I mean, as I said, it's saturated most of the year. So we did not have any issues with planting the stakes deep enough. What herbicides will you be using for the pre-planting treatment? Yeah, Chinook Bend, uh, typically with RCG, people use glyphosate. Um, that was kind of what we're playing. If anyone has any other recommendations, I don't know if like a massive here is something that um, could be used for a reed canary grass, which I would prefer not to use glyphosate to be completely honest. Um, I didn't even really want to treat the RCG before, um, but I understand why, especially with us using the fascines. I think that they're going to have a lot better of a chance if we do one year of, of herbicide treatment. Yes, uh, it was Jen Vanderhoof. She's running the, the monitoring. I see that in the Q&A here. Okay, okay, glyphosate is safer and faster. Okay, then the mass period, that's good to know. I'm curious what, if anyone has anything to say about in terms of like the effects that glyphosate does have on amphibians. That's my concern. I just, I don't know what the long-term effects of that are in such an aquatic environment because there's, you know, it's a pond. So if anybody has any insight on that, I'd really love to hear it. You know, there's some comments going into the Q&A box about the um, difference between mazapir and glyphosate. Looks like there are differences of opinion. How did you determine what live stake species you planted? Um, it was actually based on a few um, King County studies that have been done already. Um, it seems that the Pacific Willow and Sitka Willow seem to, especially Pacific Willow, seems to have the best survival rates. And uh, so those were, were kind of the, the reason for our next plantings. We are actually, the addition of Mackenzie willow is in there and I don't actually know, it was a program manager before I um, took over that ended up ordering those and I don't know what the addition of those that, that uh, was based on. Because I haven't read anything about them specifically. Did you establish a baseline water quality with reed canary grass for comparison for after suppression water quality? I'm so sorry, I did not hear that question. Did you establish a baseline water quality with the reed canary grass there for comparison for after? I did not personally know. There, there is some uh, water quality collection or information on, I believe, ecologies on Harris Creek, but we did not take water quality assessment prior to planting. Uh, 
Um, how are fascines used? Did I say that right? Fascines, yeah. So it's it's basically a bundle of of a, the small live stakes. Um, the idea is to bury them, and the they're going to grow up in a whole lot. <laughs> use my non-scientific language um there's going to be a lot of um of shoots up out and so basically even if beaver are eating the the live stakes that they're going to continually be able to outcompete the rcg i think that's like the idea behind trying to use fishings which would be difficult to try to use fishines without having treated the RCG prior because they're not going to be as tall. They're not going to be able to, uh, to outcompete the RCG without having at least one treatment in advance to, to burying the fishines. And then there are some questions from the chat. Uh, was there any vegetation management done through establishment period? Any plant protector used, or did you see any issues with their bivering? So we we couldn't use um, plant protectors in this area. I mean, it just wouldn't make sense that there's so much flooding in this um, in this creek. I mean, it isn't like it's an overflow channel for the Snoqualmie, and um, I think that you know, putting plant protectors on these stakes would probably not be very effective. Um, but yeah, we did see herbivory. Um, and honestly, I, I have to say, like, after one year, it's it's really not too bad. I mean, it still achieved quite, quite a decent um, plant density. I would say, like, at most, you know, in some areas that were a little bit, like, affected a little bit more. Um, the spacing was maybe 10 feet apart in some areas, um, which this winter we do plan to go and plant an additional 2,000 live stakes out there um, to help achieve a little bit more density. Have you explored any other site preparation methods like tilling or ripping the soil? Yeah, I don't know how that would work at a site like this. Um, it's just, I don't know how you wouldn't really be able to get any machinery down there and uh, doing that manually sounds absolutely uh, impossible financially. Um, and yeah, I just don't think you could even, the banks are so steep, I don't think you'd be able to get any machinery down at a site like this. Do you have experience with overseeding or planting native perennial grasses in RCG dominated areas? Yeah. Um, well, it only one occasion actually. Um, and it didn't work out well, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, the, the grasses without, and I, I guess I need to ask a follow-up question to that question. Um, you know, is the RCG being treated in advance with herbicide? Because um, in one case, we we did try to to seed a field with native grasses to try to outcompete the RCG, um, and it was unsuccessful. Um, another comment. If you can source source them or grow them yourself, consider eight to 12 foot two year whips from coppice with the terminal bud intact, such that the canopy establishes above mature RCG height. It's hard to buy material, but may provide an alternative. Eight to 12 foot, he specifies. Yeah, I am actually looking into potentially trying to get funding to have our own little willow harvesting area. So that is definitely something that I would like to do. 
Under sim similar planting conditions, do you know the best practice for planting black cottonwood and schoolers willow in lieu of Pacific Sitka willow? Do I know the best practice for planting them? Yeah, that's the question, black, black cottonwood. Well, we did actually plant black cottonwood at, um, at this site. We, we planted um, black cottonwood, Pacific and Sitka willow, uh, but we did not plant schoolers willow. Um, there's a lot of back and forth in the question and answer about herbicides everybody should check out. Um, one question is how do you apply herbicides in such a wet area? It's not as, well, these, the aquatic formulas are meant to be applied, it, like in the middle of summer when you could, you know, it's not, I guess the soil is like saturated a lot of the year, but I don't know if I'm not screen share. I don't know if I'm screen sharing anymore. But as you can see from like the pictures, like this is in the middle of winter where it's just covered in water and it is, the ground is saturated most of the year, but if we were to, to, to spray more towards June. I think that's something we could potentially do, but I mean, like that's the reason why it wasn't even taken into consideration for this project. You know, it was, it's wet <laughs> like all the time. So we, you know, that's why the project was, was planned this way was, you know, it's pre and post maintenance just did not seem feasible. Fencing doesn't seem feasible. And so the way that we ended up devising a plan was hope, hoping that density would be the answer. Mm -hmm. And that won't, you know, we won't know until <laughs> for years down the road you know, at that three to five year mark when when the willows can actually start creating some type of canopy. Um, and obviously the way that, the way that <laughs> riparian plantings, plantings are funded, um, you know, usually it's only a three year timeline, which obviously if you're looking at trying to make that kind of establishment in this area, like it's kind of difficult to try to do in a three year timeline. What kind of maintenance do you have after planting? None. Uh, the only thing that we're going to be doing is monitoring and then um, assessment for the survival. So we're trying to meet an 80% survival rate. And so we'll be doing some just, it's going to be some light monitoring. It's not, um, transect monitoring or circle plot monitoring. We're gonna be just doing some photo monitoring of the area and assessing areas that might need replanting, supplemental plantings. It's been great to hear the insights and discussion around the live stakes and the good strategies with how to deal with challenging habitats involving high disturbance and competition and herbivory erosion and droughts, all the other significant challenges faced in those riparian areas. From here, we're moving to talk about the later successional species, conifer establishment, and one of my personal favorite topics, assisted migration. D Denise Crownbell is a strategic advisor with Seattle City Light, working on salmon recovery in the Skagit and Tolt basins, including policy development and a focus on salmon habitat acquisition and restoration projects. She'll be giving an update on the Stossel Creek Adaptation Project. So just to kind of orient everybody, um, Stossel Creek is about 30 some miles east of Seattle and it's part of the Tolt watershed. 
Um, this is the South Fork Toll where Seattle City Light has a dam that we operate both for electricity and water. And then this is the North Fork Toll. This is Stossel Creek coming in here. It comes in after the junction um, on with the North and South Fork into the main stem tolt. The tolt empties um, just around Carnation into the Snoqualmie and the Snoqualmie heads out to Puget Sound with as part of the Snohomish. So for this um, site, it's 154 acres, pretty much oriented south to north as you're going up the property. And I say up the property um, because we have uh, five, it's between 500 and 700 feet of elevation on the property. So we have lots of different microclimates. Um, it's a uh, second growth Douglas fir was harvested in two 2012. And when City Light purchased it in 2015, it was part of the Endangered Species Act Early Action Program that we run that is to voluntarily conserve um, and enhance habitat for listed species. So in this case, steelhead. And Stossel Creek runs through the property, comes off the property some, it comes through again, about 3,500 feet of Stossel Creek. And then there's an unnamed creek that is off the property and then also comes onto the property. And um, like I said, it's a steelhead. Stossel Creek is a steelhead producer, also coho, but our focus being steelhead. And this grant was um, done in partnership with our folks from the Mountains to Sound Greenway Trust, the Northwest Natural Resource Group. And when I say uh, the city of Seattle, it's um, Seattle City Light and Seattle Public Utilities. We definitely have folks there helping us out too. And we applied for and received a Wildlife Conservation Society grant in the amount of $140,000. And um, between other city in cash or city cash and in-kind contributions, we added another $175,000 to the project, the 140,000 pretty much covered uh, the initial planting and then all the monitoring and the cultural resource survey work that we did ahead of time. Um, that's all what's incorporated into the 175,000. And then um, particularly Mountains to Sound Greenway Trust, they were able to leverage the grant um, to bring in other funders. So Car uh, Carter Subaru was also a contributor to this project. So just like, why are we looking at climate adaptation? I'm sure it will come as a surprise to none of you. I'm sure you've all probably well versed in this, but we're looking at temperature increases in Western Washington, uh, four to five degrees Fahrenheit by the middle of the century, and then an additional one to four degrees more for the end of the century. And um, obviously looking at summer temperatures um, are unfortunately expected to even be warmer than that. So five to seven degrees Fahrenheit by mid-century. And for precipitation, obviously if it's warmer, we're gonna get more precipitation that falls as rain rather than snow. So then we get a lower spring uh, snowpack and earlier snow melt. And as we've seen certainly last winter and what California experienced this uh, just recently, we're getting higher intensity events when we do get the precipitation. And so the consequences of this, at least for plant species that we're looking at is that, you know, you know, warmer temperatures and less summer precipitation make will undoubtedly stress our native trees that are adapted to colder temperatures and wetter conditions, in particular Douglas fir. Our overall goal for this property, um, and I should state South, you know, this project, it not intended as a research project. We're trying to, you know, get as much information out in the things that we've done, but there are just so many variables. Um, with the project that it, we couldn't establish it like a research project, but it's essentially uh, an adaptive management project. And um, our goal was to establish a mature forest so that 30, 50 years out, it's, it's providing ecosystem functions and that we don't need future intervention by the city. And obviously, hopefully we're looking to um, not need super future intervention much so sooner than 30 to 50 years out. But um, Certainly looking at the whole concept of expecting a warmer climate, um, we were looking to pick tree species that were adapted to warmer and drier, drier climates. Like I said, anticipating this future climate change. And so selecting species that currently grow with dug firs in, in this area, but on drier and warmer sites across Puget Sound. 
and then looking at seed sources from regions that have similar climates to what's projected to exist here at Stossel Creek later on this century. So with that, we are, um, we also incorporated obviously monitoring into this, which we'll get into and um, the, out how those monitoring projects or monitoring plots were laid out. So for folks who were here two years ago when I first gave the initial results, there was a whole series of speakers in front of me talking about the seed lot selection tool and talking about different climate change models. Um, I can't possibly replicate that information. So I'm directing you to go here if you wanna learn about the seed lot selection tool. But essentially what we did was ran a bunch of climate models and got what we thought was the best representation of what Stossel Creek climate would look like in 30 years and then 50 years, and then ran those climates through the seed lot selection tool. And that then told us where to, excuse me, where to source our tree species. So we got Doug Fir and Western Red Cedar um, from Southern Willamette Valley and the coastal range of Oregon and Northern California, looking at tree species that would be adapted to what would be local in Stossel Creek 20 to 30 years from now. And then the looking at the Southern Oregon coast range and Northern California for seed sources adapted to later on in the century, essentially like the 2080s. And just so I have some information later about the planting plan, but it's easier to see on this. So um, we had these regional seed zones for Western Washington. We had cedar, dug fir, grand pine, shore pine, Western white pine, and Gary Oak. And I refer to it as Gary Oak on some of the slides. Um, it might be listed as O-W-O. -O, so folks will see the Oregon white oak. Then from the Oregon region, we had again, cedar, dug fir, and incense cedar. And we got this because we could not get uh, red cedars from any California nurseries. So, um, and then um, from Northern California, we have the dug fir. And so talking, since I mentioned it somewhat, when we talk about assisted migration, you'll hear lots of different terms thrown around. So I just kind of wanted to clarify what we're talking about here. So with our, we have two that we have on this project, assisted population migration, and that refers to moving, you know, seed sources or populations to new locations, but within their historical species range. Um, then there's, ex excuse me, assisted range expansion, which does what it says, just kind of expanding beyond, you know, taking these populations and expanding it beyond, just beyond what would be um, considered their historical species range and essentially saying, looking at it as it could be mimicking natural dispersal. What we did not do on this site is assisted, assisted species migration. So taking an entire population or taking a population and moving it way outside of its historical species range. So we did not do that on this site. So this was more of a non-traditional planting or a reforestation. We had plenty of regeneration. Um, natural regeneration on site, um, particularly dug fir and cedars. Um, and like I said, it was harvested in 2012 and essentially nothing happened to it until we purchased it in 2017. And we really didn't start doing anything. And that was mostly, um, we'll get into it, but treating uh, weeds on site until 2018. So there were plenty of natural, natural regeneration going on site. Then for the assisted population migration, we had local species with dry tap adapted genotypes. So again, that's the dug fir and Western red cedar. Then for local population migration that were, um, came up in the grand fir, the shore pine, the Gary Oak and the Western white pine. And then again, talking about where we had assisted range expansion, we brought in incense cedar from that was sourced in Oregon. And I have to say that since I've been doing this project, I've been listening and trying to find if people have encountered incense cedar elsewhere in the Puget Sound region. And I know we have found it on certain areas in the Skagit watershed. So, um, so our whole planting approach, um, like I said, there was a property wide inventory that was completed in 2017. So we could get a good handle on what was naturally regenerating and where, because like I said, we had a lot of microclimates on the property. And you'll see on the next slide, it was provided, the property was divided into planting zones and to utilize that natural regeneration. We completed a cultural survey. Um, the ground 
prep was mostly to treat invasives for three years. And that was mostly some knotweed, um, blackberry, were the two, and scotch broom were the main culprits. And there were some other um, infestations, but to a much lesser degree. And then we were looking at for the plantings outside of the trial plots. They were uh, planted in clumps of 25 to make it easier to find them um, as we're looking years out. And then with eight to 10 feet spacing, then the trial plots were completely cleared of vegetation and planted. And we did put Vexar tubing on all the trees in the trial plots, and then the red cedars and Gary Oak and most of the shore pine. And we planted over 14,000 trees in the end of February and March of 2020. So to show you the, you know, what came of the inventory, like if you can see here, so this region one, the section one, um, eight acres, no planting. There was plenty of natural regeneration there. So same for section two, whereas section three, we have 500 seeding, cedar, seedlings of red cedar, western white pine. So it goes on like that throughout the whole property. And some of those dots do show some of the other um, infestations of uh, invasive plants that we had. But I really wanted to show, using this to show where the trial plots were. So this is on the hill slope and it's more of a colluvial um, soil. And then this area here is flatter and it's the it's kind of a gravel outwash. And sorry, and there's, so there's three uh, replicates in each of the blocks. So this was one block and this was another block. Then just to show you how we laid out um, the blocks. So 10 rows, one for each species, 90 feet one direction, 60 feet wide, and the species were randomly assigned to a row for each block. And how are we doing monitoring? We, like I said, established these six trial plots with 150 trees in each plot. Um, we are monitoring every year for five years, and then we're going to reevaluate after the five year and determine what how we want to continue monitoring. And the data being collected is mortality, height, vigor, and then any notes on damage. And I have to say this site has been um, surprisingly low on browse, which I know from uh, my Skagit properties is not the case. There's tons of browse in Skagit. So I don't know, we lucked out here, so that's helping out some. And then we do have photo points for each trial plot. And then this notation here is just some of the data collected on bigger and damage. So this is what I presented when I came here two years ago, just the results at seven months. Um, we have survival rates um, from the upper 90s all the way down to the mid 60s. So shore pine, western white pine, doing fine. Incense cedar, like around 86%. Gary oak, more like the shore pine and western white pine at 95. And then we have the cedars from Washington and Oregon, 68 and 64% survival rate. Um, you know, that was pretty rough when we saw that and then initially we're like, oh my gosh. Um, again, Grand Fir and Doug Fir kind of hold their own and I should say Washington Doug Fir whereas the Doug fir from Oregon and California had a higher survival rate than certainly that of Doug fir from Washington, so up in the upper 90s. So let's fast forward to today. So percent survival overall on your y-axis here, this is the breakout of the block, so block one and the replicate, so one of those sites, and then block one, replicate two. So you have that for six, six replicates for each species. And the overall species average survival is here at the top of the groupings. So first off, I'm sure your eyes are drawn to our red cedars of Washington and Oregon, um, much lower survival rate than the rest of the species that we show what that we have here. Then we're like, okay, Gary Oak, 94% lead in the pack. And then looking here, going from north to south, we have uh, increasing survival rates as we go from north to south of our Doug firs. So from the 70s to the 90s, as you go through Oregon and California. And then finally, just incense cedar, 
not not the only one, but certainly I'd say the one that's most markedly all over the map on its survival rate. So um, we'll hope to get more information about that. So for this first um, box plot, uh, shows the distribution of three-year height growth by species and seed sources across um, all, all six of the um, monitoring sites. And if we look, you see the Doug fir here, um, all, all the seed sources from Washington, Oregon, and California um, show similar height growth. And then species associated with Doug fir on drier sites in Puget Sound. So the Grand fir, this one here, um, the shore pine, and the western, or the white, the white pine um, grow as well as or better than the Doug firs. Then we're looking at the Gary Oak and the Gary Oak, um, which is associated with dry sites, grows very slow. Um, and then incense cedar from Washington and Oregon, sorry, the incense cedar from Washington and Oregon is growing faster than the red cedars from Oregon. So sorry, the incense, this incense cedar is from Oregon. And then our red cedars from Oregon and Washington were growing slower than this incense cedar. And so um, at least looking at some of the uh, Doug fir data, that uh, initially shows that seed sources from over the region, from you know, our local to more drier adapted climates seems to grow, they grow as well or better than the Doug fir in Washington. So potentially we could look at adding drier and warmer adapted seed sources of Doug fir to our planting sites to increase genetic variability and adaptation to future climates. And then looking at this again, that the Western red cedar from Oregon and Washington are growing slower than the drier adapted incense cedar from Oregon. And then just um, obviously there's a big difference here. The Gary Oak are very small or they're and slow growing. Um, and that is their species habit. And I do wanna say that one of the things when we initially got um, seedlings, you know, we were ordering from nurseries um, up and down the, you know, well, we had one from California, but mostly Washington and Oregon. So we were like sourcing from different nurseries. So we were getting different size stock. And obviously they, um, so we couldn't control for that. Um, and then looking at this, obviously the Gary Oak grows so much slower than the rest of these, whereas, you know, comparing that to shore pine, which just kind of all over the place as far as its variability and height growth. So on this next one, looking at um, Doug fir for three-year height growth um, by seed source and planting block. So this planting block A here is the, um, the rocky outwash. And then um, this planting block here on this side was the hill slope. So more of the colluvial hill slope material. And I do want to say that the bars with different letters um, have significant different mean height growth. So obviously we're looking here and all the Doug firs in the Rocky Outwash had no statistically different growth, whether they were from Oregon, California or Washington. But then if we're looking at seed sources over here on the hill slope that the Oregon and California did significantly better than the Doug firs, and they were all actually different from each other. But that obviously Oregon and uh, California did better. But one thing to note here is we, you know, we just can't say if the effect of this being on the outwash, which is rocky and fast draining, if that essentially overrode any advantage that could have been at least just shown here an advantage in height growth over on the hill slope. So we can't tease that out. Then in um, on this one, looking at now comparing the um, cedars and incense cedars and their three-year height growth again by seed source and planting block. So this is the A, group A is the outwash and B is the hill slope. Um, so red cedar showed similar height growth on the outwash. Um, and also, you know, it's not that different. It is different, but not that different over here. Um, but in both cases, the incense cedar um, showed greater height growth compared to the red cedar on either panel. 
So this is looking at bigger. The lighter color is zero bigger, so mortality. And as you get lighter in color, or sorry, lighter to darker, you get greater vigor. So in looking at this, you know, zero, this lighter color is zero, so completely dead. Um, and so Doug Fur is from Washington on either planting block of the outwash or the hill slope um, had the highest mortality. And that, um, that and certainly compared to looking at Doug Fur um, from Oregon or California and on either panel, or sorry, either block. So looking at this is going, comparing all the species or putting all the species and looking at um, three year vigor by the seed source and species. So looking at this, we've got, again, the lighter color being um, zero vigor. So we had the most mortality with Oregon and Washington cedars, followed by Washington, Grand Fur, or both Washington, Grand Fur and Doug Fur. And then here we're seeing that um, Gary Oak had great survival. Um, and that the survival for this, um, for the Gary Oak was um, difference in survival between the planting blocks. So the outwash and the uh, hill slope was not significant. And so I got again, I gotta just mention here that it is hard to um, do the comparison of vigor between the species um, because of the different habitat uh, morpho or sorry, the different uh, growth habits and morphology. Again, Gary Oak being the extreme outlier of like how slowly it grows, but all of them have different growth patterns. So now about the weather. Um, precipitation here in blue across the top. We have our year, year 2020 and 2021 here across the bottom. Um, mean temperatures on this y-axis and then precipitation on this y-axis. So you can see, um, just wanna show where we actually did the planting in February and March. And this is when COVID hit and we all got sent home to our houses for a while. Um, and you can see just how, you know, we're getting these, you know, intense rains, but, you know, precipitation events, cause I'll say some of this actually right in here was a, uh, uh, we had some snow right before we were going to plant. We were worried about that, being able to get the planting done. But um, so that's the precipitation. And then black line is the temperature and the orange line, or at least on my screen, it's orange is the 14 day moving average. So as you can see, you know, we're getting temperatures here. Um, okay, here's 70. And here's getting up, you know, mid 70s. And then in 2020, okay, we got an 80 degree day. And then we're going into 2021 and getting, you know, again in this, you know, 60s, 70s, we get a couple days uh, approaching 80 and then we have the heat dome. And that's what this circle is, is showing the heat dome. So we haven't had anything in the past two years that got up into the 90s and it was the low 90s up on the site. So just wanted to share that with folks. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so just kind of sharing some summary of the observations to date. So our seed sources of Doug fir from regions with drier and warmer climate grew as well or better than our Washington locally adapted Doug firs. And then Western red cedars from Washington and Oregon, Oregon grew slower than the drier adapted in incense cedar from Oregon. But we can't tease out the effect of the rocky fast draining outwash soil and the fact that that may outweigh any difference in the growth potential that we saw, or growth advantage from the seed sources that Oregon and California showed, again, related to the cedars. And then Doug firs from Washington showed significantly higher mortality on either type of soil compared to the seed sources from Oregon and California. And that our cedar seedlings from Washington and Oregon had the highest mortality, and then followed by our Washington local Doug fir and ground fir seedlings. And then, you know, the head scratcher, okay, or maybe not for some folks, I'm a fish person, not a plant person. The Gary Oak had the best survival overall and the planting trial blocks and those differences in the survival between the planting blocks were not significant. And then again, it's hard to compare the vigor between the species um, because of growth habits and morphology of the species. 
and I do want to say we are, we do have soil moisture probes up there. We haven't been able to collect all the data and run it. So we are gathering that because that I think will help hopefully give us some more information. So we did, and Northwest Natural Resource Group was great as long, along with Mountains to Sound Greenway Trust. Um, we put on a workshop right before we all got sent home for COVID with restoration practitioners and private foresters. And I just want to let folks know, like there's a lot more background information about the project here and material for private foresters at these two sites. And with that, I'll take any questions. I, I have a question. Do you know anything about um, cedars dying off in general in Western Washington? Uh, I know who the resident expert of that is. I don't know if Brenda's here on the call. I know she was the first to send me information and I was like, what? You know, she sent me some photos of some of the sites that City Light has. And I was like, wow, okay, that looks bad. So I don't know a lot about it. I just know it's happening and our trial seems to bear that out. Yeah, there's a really good um, storyboard that just came out. I'll put it in the chat. And it seems like um, cedar diseases are mostly secondary. Like they don't attack healthy trees, but they attack stressed trees. So it seems like we have really stressed trees that are being by attacked by a whole bunch of secondary pathogens. But all they're just a great storyboard just came out that talks about a myriad of factors. So I'll put it in the chat. Thank you, Brenda. Okay, and then there are a few questions in the question box. Um, Joey Holbert is conducting an experiment at WRC Sapling Survival, Washington versus Oregon in the South Sound. The Black River Riparian Natural Area has a grove of 100 experimental seedlings but they're getting watering assistance in the summer. So that's just a, oh, a comment. Okay. okay, and yeah, we're not doing any, we're not doing any watering on the site. Obviously it's pretty big to do that. Similar to previous questions, are you planning to look at how microclimates on the site affect survival and growth rates? That's something we hope to gather. We definitely put uh, moisture probes on the trial plots and then, um, and they went in, unfortunately, in 2021 after the heat dome. We couldn't get them in there before the heat dome. So, um, and I think there were still plans, because sorry, this is uh, Rolf Garsund from um, Seattle Public Utilities. He's the one who was like, it's like I, I, can, I can get that done um, and I can wrangle some money for those probes. So um, I think he was also gonna put some in some select sites, but that is definitely something um, that, as we're, you know, we're going to meet again. Um, we just met before all this to talk about what, what we saw and get some other ideas. So that's a good suggestion to look at some of those microclimate sites. Do you know how the planting project will affect salmon in the region? Uh, no, um, obviously where, you know, the riparian area around, at least around Stossel Creek um, was very well, um, it was maintained. Uh, when the harvesting happened. So as far as, you know, directly impacting the creek, I don't know. Um, and we're just, you know, trying to get this information out there because we know obviously people are planting trees in riparian areas and particularly conifers. So that um, maybe people, if they have a sunny, drier spot that they're planting, that maybe they'll consider planting some cedars that might not be sourced from Washington, but from some of our Southern neighbors with some warmer, drier climate. So that's what we're hoping to tease out, but not knowing how it will directly impact salmon, not yet for sure. Um, was there any quarantine for incoming species for pests or other pathogens? Yes, Mountains to Sound um, ran that. Um, they, um, and the group that was um, doing the actual planting, they did that. Um, for our next presentation, we have Brenda Clifton, who is a senior restoration botanist at the Skagit River System Cooperative and a plant ecologist with over 20 years of experience in plant biology and propagation. At SRSC, she manages the vegetation aspects of salmon habitat restoration projects, including designing projects, conducting vegetation surveys, and managing a native nursery with over 15,000 plants. 
Her talk is titled Exploring Strategies for the Under Understory Planting of Conifers in Deciduous Forests. So yes, as Andrea mentioned, my name is Brenda Clifton. I'm the Senior Restoration Botanist for the Skagit River System Cooperative. And I just wanted to share with you kind of our progression of thinking when it came to planting conifers in the understory of deciduous forests, and then also share a study with you comparing plantings in, clearing, in clearings and in the shade. Uh, just a little bit of context. Um, studies have shown that conifers have a lot of traits that are good for salmon habitat compared to deciduous trees. Um, they tend to grow taller, be longer living, and when they finally do fall into the creek to form large woody debris, they tend to persist longer. And so a lot of our restoration properties have areas that were cleared or thinned by landowners in the past. And after the disturbance, if they were left alone, um, they came back as in deciduous forests. But then if this were a natural system and there were no further disturbances, conifer species would move into the understory of that deciduous forest and grow up and turn into a climax conifer forest. On our sites, they're usually surrounded by farmlands and you know residential areas. And so there's not the seed source of climax forests to you know promote succession. And then there are also a lot of invasive species and even pasture grasses that don't let things new things germinate on the site. So when left alone, these deciduous forests are just persisting as deciduous forests, which is why our program started um, putting conifers in the understory. And initially we would go into a deciduous forest and just haphazardly throw um, baby shade tolerant trees in, and we would mow the um, understory growth around the trees and they would be like 40 feet apart through the whole forest and then when we would come back the following year to maintain them they were really hard to find because the understory had grown back up and they also grew super slowly uh, this is a tree out at tennis creek on the suado that's 11 years old and it's still a few feet tall so our strategy progressed to looking for natural understory clearings in deciduous forests. Uh, this is a planting site out at Government Bridge on the Skagit River. And our um, trees, they're a little hard to see, but they're all flagged and they're really small. And this worked a lot better. We planted them densely in these natural clearings and we were able to find them and they grew quickly. The reason we were so concerned with how fast they're growing is our grant cycles are normally three to five years, and we want the trees we plant to be taller than the understory when the grant's over and we stop maintaining the trees. But while these trees grew really well initially, these natural overstory clearings were kind of small, and I'm finding that inevitably the overstory clearing would close around year seven or 10, and the trees we planted would stop growing. And so we started thinking about maybe um, creating our own clearings that were large enough to be persistent and really get the conifers we're planting to a good size. And so we did a pilot study where we um, removed some of the alders in the clearing and then planted cedar and spruce underneath them and looked at um, how well they grew, how well they survived. And then I also kept track of how much it cost because this is the first time we're doing it. Um, to step back, the Skagit River System Cooperative is a co-op formed by the Swinomish and Sauk-Suwaddle tribes 
to help them manage natural resources on their shared, usual, and accustomed fishing and hunting grounds. So the Swinomish tribe is located in the estuary of the Skagit River, which is in western Washington, Skagit County. And then the Soxhuatl tribe is located in the foothills in Darrington on the Sauk River, which is a tributary to the upper Skagit River. And then their shared usual and accustomed fishing and hunting grounds included all of the Skagit Basin. And so that's where we do our restoration work. And the site where we did the pilot study is called Savage Slough. It's a Seattle City Light conservation site and it's located in the middle Skagit River, just to the east of the town of Hamilton on the south side of the river. Here is an aerial photo of the site and it also shows our pilot planting areas. Um, the site is really great for salmon habitat. It is not only located right on the Skagit River, but there are several backwaters running through the site that provide habitat for rearing juveniles. And at the same time, Mill Creek comes into the system right here. And so during high water events, you have both the Skagit River and Mill Creek backing into the site. Seattle City Light purchased the property in 2011, and they have been funding the restoration of the property, and they also funded the pilot study. So since they purchased the site, we've planted over 40 acres on the site, mostly in these pasture areas. If you look closely, you can see um, our trees starting to pop through. And then the only section along this river to the north of the South Skagit Highway that they don't own is kind of this piece between the two houses that you can see. So we had three treatment sites and they range from seven tenths of an acre to an acre each. And then we treated 87 alders. Those are signified by these little orange dots. And we only did alders that were less than a foot and a half wide at breast height. And we treated them with the hack and squirt method, which is where you take a ax and kind of um, put slashes all the way around the tree and then squirt it with, we use pure triclopyr. We had initially wanted to girdle the trees, but we ended up doing the treatment in the spring, which is the wrong timing for girdling. So in 2019, we planted 1,250 spruce and 1,250 western red cedar total in these areas. Um, this site has a lot of elk, and so we planted the spruce and the cedar in the same holes. Another study we did at this site found that that reduced browse on the cedars by 80%. So that's just kind of our common practice at this site. And we planted these at a density of 450 to 650. Notice I say holes per acre because each hole had two trees in it. We also had some control areas that were to the west of both plot S and R where we had trees planted in full shade, the same way with spruce and cedar planted in each tree. And then for this study, we monitored the trees that are in these plots with the yellow circles. So in 2022, three years later, we measured both growth and survivorship in the treatment areas. Those plots I mentioned are two tenths of an acre, large and circular. Um, in theory, containing 100 trees. But we ended each, but we ended up measuring 266 cedars and 200 in 
82 spruce in the treatment sites. And then the control sites were much smaller and we only measured 19 cedars and 21 spruce in the full shade. Um, here's just some visual representation of the results. So this is our treatment sent site R in the summer of two, 2019, right after we planted it. Um, it. It's a little hard to see, but our trees are, well, some of them are marked by stakes with flagging on them. I'm sure we went back in and flagged the rest afterwards. And then here are the same trees in 2022. So you can see they put on quite a bit of growth. Some of them were actually six feet tall. And then this is treatment site T in the summer of 2019. And then once again, here is the site in 2022. Um, there's a pretty big tree in the foreground out of focus that you can see. Then the majority of our planted trees, you can kind of see in the background in this corridor, they also did really well. In terms of survivorship in our clearing areas, spruce survivorship was 82% and cedar survivorship was 77.3%. And then in the full shade, spruce survivorship was 84% and cedar survivorship was 76%. Uh, that's looking at the species individually in terms of success for our restoration planting, I actually look at whether there's a tree in each hole. And if there's at least one tree, I consider that a survived tree because in about 10 years, we're gonna go through and remove um, any spruce that are still in the same holes with cedars. If they're in a hole by themselves, we'll leave them. So anyways, looking at just how many Holes still had trees in them. Survivorship was even better, 93.1% 93 total for a density of 535 trees per acre. And I put in the notes that no replanting is needed because actually our density goal is 190 trees per acre. And this is based on recommendations in the forest practice rules for reforestation but we plant a lot more densely than this initially because we're trying to quickly establish 100% cover to keep weeds from moving into the site. And also, you know, with drought and freezing and elk browse, we can lose a lot of plants. And so our, our survivorship goal is more like 34%, but that's when we're done with our grant cycle and we're not maintaining the trees anymore. And this site still has another year to reach this point, but it's still doing really well. Um, here are the results of the growth. There were significant differences in growth between both the treatment areas and the shade, but also a little bit between species. So in the, last two columns in this chart, the little letters significant, sig signify if there was a significant difference between the um, results. And so you can see in the clearings, there was a difference between cedar growth, actually between plots R and S and T. Uh, plot R was a little bit wetter, and so I think the cedar just grew better there. And then there was also a significant difference in the growth of the trees in the clearing for clearings versus the trees in the shade. And then for spruce, we just saw a significant difference between the trees growing in the shade and the trees growing in the clearings. There wasn't a difference between the different clearings. Then we also saw that there was a significant difference in the growth of um, spruce and cedars, not in the shade, but in clearing plots S and T. Here's kind of a visual representation of that. 
And you can see that in all three clearings, the trees grew better than they did in the shade. In the shade, it wasn't significant, but cedars did grow more than spruce, which is maybe unsurprising since cedars are more shade tolerant. And then you can see here in clearing R, the cedars just took off and they're the same size as the spruce. But in clearing S and T, the spruce grew more than the cedars, which is what I would expect most of the time when I put cedars and spruce on a site with, you know, in like a pasture, the spruce grow quicker, more quickly than the cedars. Some takeaways from these results. Um, we got similar results to other studies I found where they looked at conifers growing in understories versus clearings, which I guess is not surprising, like trees grew better with more light than they did in full shade, but also kind of surprising because in plant physiology, they taught us that in shade, you know, plants tend to get tall and spindly to reach for the light. And so, you know, I was open to either conclusion, but in our study, the trees definitely grew taller in the clearing areas. This says to me that success of understory plantings, and by I'm defining success by the trees are taller than the overstore, understory when the grant cycle ends, so we can stop maintaining them. This depends on sufficient light at ground level. I actually found some studies that talked about the minimum appropriate overstory gap for a lot of coniferous species. And I'm happy to send you that article if you're curious. It's Mason 2004. And they didn't have cedar, but they did have spruce. And they said the minimum appropriate overstory gap was let's see, at least as wide as the surrounding trees are tall. Or in other words, the ratio of the gap diameter to the height of the surrounding trees, so diameter divided by height, was between one and two. So at our sites, the average tree height of the surrounding trees was 97.5 feet tall. And the clearings, were between 117 and 127 feet um, on the narrow end, not the long end. So the ratio was between 1.2 and 1.3. So within the, you know, minimum or above the minimum appropriate overstory gap. I think the next interesting steps for this would be to expand the study to include other species that we plant in the understory, such as Western hemlock, Western white pine, and grand fir. The sites in this study were pretty wet, so we kind of went with um, wetter species. Um, as I mentioned, I kept costs of the track of the costs for this. And compared to our usual restoration plantings, which are typically in pastures, the clearing areas cost 12% more on average just to plant. And so at the time, our normal plantings were running about $5,000 per acre, and these cost $6,170. I found that the additional cost was in the labor it took to treat the alders with herbicide. So in thinking about the benefits of this, we like our trees, our understory trees to be about five feet when we stop maintaining them. So they're well over the um, surrounding understory plants. And in this study, our clearing plants, both species would have reached that in four years. But in the full shade, it would have taken cedars five years to reach that height and spruce seven years to reach that height at an additional cost of $2,000 per year to continue to maintain these trees. And so planting um, these trees and clearings 
as opposed to the full shade, saved $830 per acre for cedars and $4,830 per acre for spruce. So quite a substantial savings. And so I think on appropriate sites, this um, is a good tool to expand where we can successfully plant trees for salmon habitat restoration moving forward. Are there any questions? One question is, was there a reason you treated the alders with herbicide instead of felling them? Yes. Um, this program is partially funded with wildlife funds from Seattle City Light. It's not just salmon um, restoration funds. And the wildlife um, biologist was interested in having some snags for wildlife. And so we also um, counted the number of snags we created and um, kept track of how long they stood. Unfortunately, I think it was two years ago, we had a crazy windstorm and it pretty much came in and knocked down almost every standing tree that we had left. Adam is asking if you had any um, increased issues with invasive species in the gaps created. I would say yes. One of the sites had some blackberry in it that wasn't particularly prolific. And then when we opened it up, the blackberry um, expanded but then we just treated it and now it doesn't seem to be a problem. We also found a patch of knotweed in one of the sites, but I think that would have been there anyways. It was right in one of the, the backwater channels. Do the maple leaves have an effect on understory seedling growth? You know, there's not a lot of maples in this particular site. It was almost all alders. But I think the seedlings we put in would have been, would be large enough that um, maple leaves would not be able to cover them. I forgot to mention that when we put them in, the cedars were one foot tall and the spruce were one and a half feet tall. That kind of leads into the next question, which is, can you go over the co-planting of the Sitka with the cedar um, in one hole again? And um, does this protect it from Elbrus? Yeah, so the um, elk in the Skagit Valley, their population has really been re rebounding. And so since I've been working here, we went from not having elk in any of our sites to having elk in pretty much all of our sites. <laughs> and I swear they'd like stand around and watch us plant all day. And then when <laughs> we'd go home at night, They'd pull up all our plants. I think they'd go to like munch on the cedars and they'd be bare roots and they'd be like, this isn't a real tree. And they'd pull them up and they were pulling up like 500 plants over a weekend. And so I did a study just to try and figure out some ways to keep the elk from um, destroying our plants. And we looked at uh, bud protectors because they were also damaging the deciduous plants by eating buds and uh, repellents, and then companion plantings, and both planting spruce and cedar in the same hole and um, treating them with a repellent called plant skid reduced browse by 80%. But the plant skid is a lot more expensive than companion planting and even going back and thinning. And so we reserve the um, repellent to deciduous plantings. And then they don't tend to really do too much damage to our other conifers, it's just the cedars. And since we've been planting spruce in the same hole, it's pretty much taken care of the problem. Uh, what was the maintenance regimen for trees planted in uncleared plots? Uh, yes, we continued to mow the native understory around the plants during establishment and treated noxious weeds in the site. 
uh, once a year for each. And we're going to continue to do that. The um, mowing, I think we need to do for at least another year. And the weeds will keep on until the um, canopy or the trees start to fill in. Did you measure, measure the shade or light difference between the treatment and reference sites? Would no. To know for future site selection. Yeah, I did do that for my um, graduate study. We had, you know, like a machine that would measure uh, far PAR radiation in the sun and shade, but I didn't do that for this study. Are you considering comparing artificial clearings with the natural clearings? No, I hadn't, but that's a good thought. I think um, it would have to be a really long study because then the natural clearings did great for, you know, seven years. And then the trees just kind of stopped growing because the canopy would, cl would close in. Is there a plan to also plant shrubs and ground covers or just trees? Uh, just trees because the surrounding area has a ton of diversity of shrubs. And every year we go in and what we're mowing down are shrubs. And so I'm sure as soon as we stop mowing them, the shrubs are just going to fill in naturally. Are the areas being treated using restoration funding? areas or that were logged and replanted at some point in the past 20 years for commercial forest re reproduction? No, they're being funded with um, Seattle City Light conservation funds. Do you know what the long-term effects of planting two trees in the same hole is? Well, all I have are observational, my observations, and we've been doing this for about a decade. And one great thing I've noticed is that um, when the trees stop being browse height and start being rub height, the cedars are a lot more pliable and the elk are killing the spruce by rubbing on them and the cedar are persisting. It's about time we put these elk to work but um, we go in and thin our plantings around year 10. And so at that point, like once the trees start touching and are competing with themselves and their neighbors for light and water, we're gonna go in and selectively thin. Did you continue to mow the native understory around the plantings during establishment? Yes. One of the other things like, you know what I what we often hear um, from in the in-stream flow things and have had a combat is people saying, "Oh well, conifers they suck up water and blah blah blah." But the one good thing that they do for stream hydrology, and I and I I could put in the chat the paper that I talked about it in, um, is the fog drip mechanism. Uh, you know, actually taking the you know by taking the fog water. Um, it helps it get back into streams. So, you know, the, the simplified arguments that trees just suck up water um, is, is, is a spacious one. And especially too, because, you know, another reason of course, is that stream shade keeps the water temperatures down, which is better for some monads. And so we, we often see people trying to oversimplify those things to make it sound like cutting trees down is going to improve hydrology for salmonids, but it's definitely, it's, that's not necessarily true. And, and, uh, but I don't, obviously that's a different topic. I won't get into that, but it's just, um, we do need, we did, we do need more conifers back and, uh, your project, uh, sounds like a very good one for that. So thanks. Thanks for your talk. Yep. <laughs> And imagine like conifers use more water than deciduous species species do. I mean, they are awake all year, but yeah, yeah. Well, that's part of the reason that you know people have said that. Um, and but but because of the fog drip mechanism, 
conifers make up for some of that. And so, um, um, and people often forget that. I, mostly I was just emphasizing that sometimes people knock conifers and they shouldn't be because we need more of that if we want to protect the Salmonids. So, mm -hmm. so good job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So another question about the companion planting, how many years did you leave the spruce cedar combo in one hole before pulling the spruce? Um, I generally wait until the trees on either side are touching. So it's between 10 and 15 years, depending on, you know, kind of site conditions and how quickly the surrounding vegetation grows. And plus what survivorship was initially on better survive on sites with better survivorship, I will do it more, more quickly and with poor survivorship, you know, then I, they won't need thinning as soon, but between 10 and 15 years. Did you use mesh tubes around the cedar spruce companion plantings? No, I only use protective tubes in pasture plantings because I only use them for protection against voles. And we haven't really found a lot of difficulty with voles in forested habitats. They kind of they tend to prefer the pastures. Do western red cedars generally grow faster? in clearings with more sunlight or do they grow faster in the shade? In this study, they grew faster in clearings with more sunlight, significantly. So there are two more questions about um, the companion planting. Still struggling to understand how both trees are planted in the same hole. And can you explain how large the hole is? So we use an auger that's on a dingo and it makes a hole that's, I think it's nine inches wide and 18 inches deep. And we, if we are using bare roots, we just hold them together. Or if we're using nursery stock, we knock all the dirt out. So they're kind of bare roots and then we hold them together. We put it so that the spruce is on the Southern side and the cedars on the Northern side, since the spruce likes the light more than the cedar does. And then we hold them and plant them both at the same time. Sounds like you better write a paper about this. You know, I have another presentation about it and I did write a paper. It's on, I think it's on our website, but I presented it a bunch when I wrote it. And so I haven't presented it since because a lot of people have seen that presentation already. Yeah, if you look at um, the Skagit River System Cooperative website under documents, under C for Clifton. It's called Comparison of Deterrence to Reduce Elk Rubbing and Herbivory in a Kate, Skagit River Restoration Plant thing. Kate put it in the question box for us. Oh, sweet, thanks. Yeah, so um, Regina from the Skagit Land Trust is gonna uh, sum up for today. Thanks, Regina. Thanks. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us for today's presentations. My name is Regina. I work for Skagit Land Trust, like Andrea just mentioned, uh, and I also serve on the board of the Northwest Chapter of the Society for Ecological Restoration. Um, I'd like to thank all of the speakers who presented today. They made time in their sometimes very full schedules uh, to share information they've learned to help us all improve the good work we're doing across the region. They covered a lot of ground, <laughs> everything from knowledge sharing to monitoring to specific techniques and lessons learned. So um, a really big thank you to Paul, Bob, Jason, Anthony, Brianna, Denise, and Brenda. Um, you know, our, we couldn't pull off these opportunities to share information without people who are willing to actually share and talk about what they're doing and trying out. Um, this conference is organized by the Western Washington Riparian Work Group, a technical learning group that brings together riparian restoration practitioners to build networks, share practical information, and improve outcomes. Please keep your eyes peeled for a post-conference survey and take a few minutes to fill it out for us. Those survey answers help to motivate and guide us in planning the next event. If you're interested in joining the listserv that's come up a couple times today, um, send Brenda an email. I know it's been a really helpful resource for me when planning out projects and troubleshooting issues uh, that I come across in my work. 
Last but not least, if you want to help organize the next conference, uh, let us know. We'd love your help. It's always fun to have um, someone who's excited and has some new ideas and contacts to join us. So we'd be happy to talk to you. Um, one final note to toss out um, more on behalf of SER Northwest, if you were really excited about the Salish Sea Wiki that Paul spoke about earlier, and you're interested in getting involved with the local SER chapter, um, please reach out to me. SER Northwest is currently looking for a Northwest chapter representative to serve on the Wiki coordinating circle. So if that's something that you're excited about, I'd love to talk to you. Um, thank you all for your time today, uh, to all the presenters and to everyone who attended and asked some great questions, um, and have a wonderful rest of your day.